Right, welcome to the November meeting of DCC. Um, please note in case people have urgent appointments this evening, the clock says seven o'clock, but of course it just hasn't been put back yet. So it is actually just gone six. Um, right, I've got just quick housekeeping um, before we start. Uh, if you could switch off any mobile phones so we don't get any interruptions. The meeting will be filmed uh, for live and subsequent broadcast. Um, so by sitting in the chamber, you are pretty much agreeing to being being filmed. Um, if there's a fire alarm, it obviously won't be a it won't be a, a, a test or anything. So exit. I wouldn't recommend using any other exits than the one you came in through. Because it's quite dark out there now. Um, for members, the usual advice: try and speak into the microphone as clearly as you can. Raise your hands if you want to speak. To um, wait for an invitation to speak from the chair, all debate and comments and uh, through through the chair. Um, questions to officers can be direct to officers, of course. Um, make sure your cards are all into your stuck in your. Um, are we actually using cards? No. Oh, we're not. Okay. In which case, ignore that. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure whether we'll be doing hands up or. Um, it'll be hands up. Okay. So everything's down then. All right. Okay. So on the agenda, apologies. Um, I've got apologies from Councillor Cornell. Not aware of any other apologies. Anybody know of any? No. Nope. Okay. Um, no declarations of interest I'm aware of either. Nope. Um, minutes of the 6th of September meeting. Uh, can you put your hand up if you're happy for me to sign them as a correct record? Obviously, the ones who are actually here. Okay. It's fine. I'll sign those at the end. On the planning schedule, right, first item is... Uh, land west of Stonehouse parcels H13 and H14 of the Great Albury development. Uh, it's a reserve matters application in respect of the erection of 216 dwellings, landscaping infrastructure, associated works. Um, so uh, there's already outlined planning permission um, and uh, master plan on this. It's simply the detailed. Uh, reserve matters and the case officer Simon Penketh is going to introduce his report. Uh, I don't think I need to say anything else about that, do I? There's no late, there's no late papers. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thanks, Simon. Thank you, Councillors. Good evening. So the application is uh, proposed 216 houses on uh, some of the, one of the parcels for the, or two of the parcels, sorry, for the uh, Great Oldbury development. Um, I'll just put the put the site into context for you. This is the master plan for the outline planning permission. Um, we are interested in parcel H13. Can you see my pointer, by the way? You're all okay with that. That you can see uh, parcel H13 and half of H14, so the uh, western half. Um, as I say, the proposal is for 216 houses, uh, and those are made up of. Uh, Six, well, they include 65 affordable units as set out in the officer report. So there are on the, I'll just go through the next plan for you. Um, this is the master plan or the area, the local, the, 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 the closer master plan, uh, which was approved by this committee back in June. Um, and so we can see H14 and H13 here. H15 was part of that master plan. It's not coming forward as part of this development. That will come forward in due course. And we're looking at half. So this this road down the middle demarcates where the proposal is located, and then it's the whole of H13. Um, so there's the site as proposed, the red line site plan as we refer to them. Now this is the original. Uh, sorry, that, no, that's not the original submission. I'll give you the original the original submission um, for the development. We've got 38. So he has 38 houses in the H14 area, and the rest 178 in the lower the, the H13 area. Now members will be probably aware of the there were some objections raised by local community and the parish um, 
principal objections were around the location of the flats and the concern that the height of that building would introduce an overlooking issue. Um, my professional opinion was that there is enough distance to prevent that and preclude that from happening. But nonetheless, uh, the applicant engaged with the local community and we ended up with a revised scheme which moved the flats into the more centrally into the H13 area. Um, now, from my perspective, I think that actually works a little better. But what we've got is a is a row of uh, a terrace of four units, which they're calling the landmark units, uh, in this corner here. So the flats have moved into the central area here. That has allowed uh, um, more improved access for the uh, for the occupants of those flats, including the um, uh, special access range needs for the for the ground floor flats. So the parking spaces are closer to the flat. So I think that that was an overall improvement and deals addresses with the concerns being raised by the local community and the parish council. So other other issues raised was uh, parking concerns, traffic concerns, especially with uh, the flats uh, blocking views from the junction, forward visibility from the junction. The highway authority are happy that the application is acceptable, recommended that they had no objection subject to a condition requiring that the uh, parking spaces and cycle parking provided prior to first occupation. So that is in the conditions list for you at the end of the report. So we have some street scenes for you. Uh, some of the areas of concern raised by local residents were was also about the materials and the design of the houses not being consistent with the surrounding area. Um, my view is that they are consistent with the general surrounding pattern of development. And um, what we generally have is the, is a is a spine road frontage, which is along in area A here. And those are generally the larger houses. They've got uh, a tree line avenue a sort of approach with, with driveways straight onto the to the main road. And then there's a the, the central areas are a bit closer together, a bit more dense, but again with some uh, landscaping, trees in the front gardens, etc., to soften the effect. And here's the, here's the landmark. Um, units which is located on the um, on the roundabout which I pointed out to you. Sorry. So these units here. So a cross section um, through the site I was a little bit concerned that the, the, the topography of the site means that there's it, if you remember from the site visit it, raised, it, ri it rises slightly towards the north uh, but also dips towards the east so there's a, uh, a pronounced, well, it, it's not very high, but there's a pronounced rise in the center here. So I asked the applicant to provide me with a cross section. You can see the block of flats in the middle. These are three stories high with two story units around them. So uh, my opinion is that uh, I'm, I'm satisfied that we won't, they won't stick up above the, you know, the, the roofscape and look odd in the, in the street scene from the main roads. Um, so. Uh, that works quite well. Um, these are the, this is the roof or the overall height sort of uh, design. We've got the block of flats in the middle here, those three stories high, um, and some, a number of two and a half stories, so two stories of rooms in the roof with the dormer window units uh, in certain parts of the development, and the majority of the site is two stories high. Um, the block of flats, by the way, contains nine affordable units. That's three one-bed units and six two-bed units. The remaining units are scattered through the site, uh, like so. Um, I forget which what the colours represent. Apologies. Um, the, uh, they represent either shared units or uh, uh, rent units. Uh, the housing officer is satisfied that the mix is acceptable. He's also satisfied that the mix is acceptable across the board. Um, there are some anomalies with there being um, nine clusters of nine units, which is one more than we would normally encourage. Um, obviously, the block of flats is, if you're going to have nine units, then they have to be, we couldn't have one non-affordable or, or market unit within that it wouldn't work very well for the, um, for the, for the, for the RSL. Uh, we've got some group together in 
more than eight or there's nine here but these are accessed from different frontages so we're reasonably content that 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 is acceptable and the clusters will prevent will allow them to integrate into the whole uh, development uh, okay um, this is the flat this is the front elevation of the flats um, we have had some improvements to that we've, we've changed the appearance uh, to, to have a bit, a bit more of a contemporary style so we've got render and brick uh, and a sort of mox lake roof um, this is the other elevations which are generally not seen from the public realm so this is the front the main door and these are the side elevations um, and I think that's it for me I So uh, through the course of the application, we've had, we've seen the applicant has engaged with the community and, and addressed the concerns being raised and all of the, the, the other issues uh, of concern have been addressed in the officer report. Uh, the recommendation is one of approval subject to the, to the conditions set out for you. Thank you. Thanks, Simon. <clears throat> okay, I move on to public speaking. Um, don't think we've got ward members wanting to speak or parish council or anybody in opposition i think the only one we have is um jonathan coombs the agent if you can come to the microphone you'll have four minutes unfortunately i don't think we're going to have a timer up on the screen for you so um we'll be timing it on the phone and i'll um give you a warning when we get to get getting close to four minutes okay thank you chair good evening committee and thank you for the opportunity to speak my name is Jonathan Coombs and I am speaking in favour of the scheme as the agent acting for the applicant. We welcome the officer recommendation for approval and do not wish to repeat the report's contents. So I'll instead and focus on the collaborative working with your officers and the local community to achieve the scheme before you today for consideration. Following receipt of the original parish and community objections summarised within your report, we engaged with the parish council who hopefully facilitated a meeting with the chair, Councillor Bullock, as well as Councillor Coombs as well as circa 15 to 20 local residents at the site on the 21st of September to discuss their concerns. At this meeting, we tabled a revised layout approach to address the key concern of location for flattered accommodation opposite existing properties, as you've heard, by locating this further within the site. We we're also able to discuss a range of other issues raised in the comments received. The revised layout was welcomed by those present. Local residents were also provided with copies of the draft amended layout to circulate with others who could not attend and shared on Facebook groups and what have you. We also relayed the outcome of this meeting to the ward councillors, Councillor Stephen Davies and Councillor John Jones, who were unable to attend and offered to meet with them separately. They had also been updated by Councillor Bullock and welcomed the dialogue with the community and noted they were engaged for the next parish council meeting if they considered necessary. The scheme before you is based on these discussions held at that meeting with the parish councillors and local community, as well as further meetings that we held with the case officer and the public right of way officer to ensure that all technical concerns raised during the course of the application were addressed. These formal revisions were consulted upon with the local community and the parish council again. We note that despite 24 objections from 15 different households being received at the initial proposals, that no further comments have been received to the application on these latest revisions. Whilst it does not represent formal endorsement, the lack of these further objections from those members of the public is reflective of the engagement undertaken and revisions to address their concerns. Moreover, the Parish Council have commented to confirm that they support the changes to the layout. While we understand the application was called into committee by the Parish Council, we've been proactive in engaging with the Parish and the local community to address their concerns, and we consider this is reflected in the lack of objections to the current proposals before you. We therefore consider the scheme represents an example of how the planning process should work collaboratively with offices and local communities to address and overcome concerns. Overall, we respectfully request that the item resolve to be granted in accordance with the recommendation for approval. Thank you for your time. Thank you. All right. Uh, questions from members to officers. Anybody got any questions? Yes, Martin. Yes, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Simon. Um, I asked this at the site visit, but I'll ask it again for confirmation, please. Um, as I understand it, there is no PV proposed, no solar panels on the buildings, no heat pumps, no communal heating. Um, and also, and the, the 
well on that on that matter and i think what you told me at the site meeting was that that's beyond the purview of this decision as reserved matter could you confirm that otherwise please yeah so so as i see it that that's that's an that that sort of concept is is uh, further down the, or earlier in the process so outline stage we expect that sort of arrangement to be agreed in principle prior to um, being submitted in, in the design scheme but what I would say is that there, there are no physical renewables on the site but obviously modern build, uh, improved building regulations is, is, is moving on and actually the, the performance of these buildings will have to meet that um, and uh, just beyond, I think the developer is offering the, um, I forget the name now, um, uh, fabric first type approach, um, which is fairly standard across the industry. Um, of course, we'll, we will see boilers, etc., that are highly efficient, meet highly efficient standards um, moving forward. So it's not all, it, even though there are no solar proposed with the scheme, I think that the scheme will work very well in terms of insulation, etc. Yes, thank you. Yeah, no, I understand it has a, although not passive house, it's, I think, no. it's the average EPC of B mm. across this development. I also, similar question really about the materials to be used, a lot of brick, which I think is high embodied carbon material. Again, I think you told me this is, this was something that does, that's, um, it's too late to do anything about. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, in, in terms of the materials, it's a mix of brick, render, and the, behind the render will obviously be uh, concrete uh, block facing. But um, as, I, as I understand it, most houses now are built with um, very, they are generally built with uh, conservation or uh, carbon reduction in mind, and um, there'll be pre, pre, uh, prefabricated frames, etc., going in on that site, uh, similar to what's being built out now. Thank you. Yes, Lucas. Um, yeah, I just would like to, as a point of information also for future meetings, um, there's no self-build in this particular section of the development. And I've been told there's only four in the whole development. I was wondering whether that meets our own criteria for the amount of self-build. And could I be informed maybe also after the meeting um, how we actually proceeding with self-build? because there's apparently no self-build till the end of the scheme. And I'm still not sure about the mechanism that's used to actually invite self-builders to, uh, or yeah, former self-builders to actually uh, occupy these sites and work with. So I would love some information on that in the future. The quantity of self-build on the site is, is more than four, I'm sure it's, it's nine. Yeah, nine. I've, I've got nine in my, in my mind. Um, but um, there's none on this parcel here, but they, they sh they're supposed to come forward. So we will expect there's, there's a parcel and a half left. So let's see what comes forward. Chair, can I just say we can clarify that for you and get the correct number to you? Yeah, Victoria. You mentioned um, earlier about materials and you said it was going to be a mock slate. Um, what is the slate going to be made out of? They're normally made out of fibre cement. Okay. Um, so they'll look like slate and they're, they're usually quite convincing. They're when quite you see convincing. them on, on the samples, they're, they're pressed. Okay. So they'll look like real slate. Um, or you might get concrete tiles, which are just dark in colour. Um, but those materials are acceptable on this on on this in this particular circumstance any more questions if not does anybody wish to propose the officer advice which is to approve i guess jenny anybody seconded uh okay council patrick lorraine thanks um so we can move on into debate anybody wish to debate anything on this if not, we can go straight to a vote. Yes, Lorraine. It's not a debate, really, just a comment. How refreshing it is to see the applicant engaging with the community. 
Okay. Right. Nobody else. Yes, Martin. Oh, thank you, Chair. Follow up to my question. Um, I'm. I don't like having to vote to approve something that doesn't have what I think ought to be the standards of um, building and energy use. Today, I would cite from uh, Core Policy 14 that. Um, uh, sustainable construction techniques, including facilities for recycling of water and waste, measures to minimize energy use and maximize renewable energy production. And it doesn't seem to me that this development does that. Um, but I take the point that we're too late in the process. Yes, agreed. Uh, Lorraine. I was wondering whether or not the design. Sorry, of Martin, the could you just switch your. Michael. Sorry. No. Whether or not the design of the buildings and the modern construction of the buildings, uh, etc., may offset some of that. Well, there, there are two two points, I suppose. One about the the energy, the the insulation level, the energy efficient, efficiency, and as I said, I think it's uh, said to be an EPC rating and B average, which is not A, but it's good. Um, but the the energy energy production um, point is is a different one, and um, insulation doesn't speak to that. Okay, so I think we can go to the vote then. All those in favour of approval, reluctantly or otherwise, that's carried. In fact, I think that's unanimous. Okay, moving on. Second application is. <clears throat> oh yes, uh, just hang. Get, bear with us a second while we, case officers, swap around the seats. Okay, second item is play, a play area at Bourne, Brimscombe, erection of four dwellings. Case officer is Nick Gardner, and he's going to introduce his report now. Thank you, Chair. Good evening. Um, so, yeah, this is for the site of the play area, the Bourne, Brimscombe. It's for the erection of four dwellings and associated works. So, we have the site in red outlined here, and then um, the in the applicant's ownership is Queen's Court set below, um, below the site here. So um, this, do this for context. So the site is a mature area of land with dense hedge boundaries and numerous trees, including protected walnut trees central to the site. And the site is accessed from a steep and narrow lane, which then joins the A419. The site lies within development limits of Brimscombe, a third tier settlement, where there is a presumption in favour of development subject to other material considerations. Um, it's outside of the AOMB, so this site just to, um, this plan, sorry, um, we've got the pink, which is the area of outside natural beauty, and the site, which is easy to pinpoint by the curved um, public right of way here. Um, so it's outside the, um, outside of the conservation area, which is set to the south. Um, we have a public right of way that runs to the east of the site, and then one that runs through the site from um, the west to the north. It's in the catchment of the Robber Common um, Special Area of Conservation and the Cotswolds Beechwoods, and it's adjacent to the Charlie Community Gardens here. Um, and it was called to called to committee on the grounds of um, policy HC1 um, being um, the development and characteristic cluster of dwellings that poorly relate to the site and erode in the open nature, and for ES7, which is for um, failing to conserve and enhance the setting of the AOMB. 
apologies. It's okay. Um, so this is just to um, give some more context. So some photos of the site so that we can see um, the the condition, the condition of the site, and then also its connection with public rights of way, um, and then to the wider um, open space and green green spaces. Um, so the site's currently an open parcel of land in private ownership, following the sale of Queen's Court and the application site from Stride District Council. Queen's Court below is a modernist flat roof housing block. As the site's named. Um, it has historically been a play area in virtue of planning permission that was granted in the 1970s and used as such with equipment then being removed in the 80s and the land being an open parcel of land since. The site has never been designated as a play area and has not been designated as open space within the local plan or any um, subsequent uh, development documents. Um, so it's used and has been, um, it has been used by the public and it's been assumed to be public open space however again it's not designated the site was included within the quality open space and green infrastructure audit and um, it as at that time it was within a uh, public body ownership the feedback as 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 part of that was that the site had poor accessibility and could be a great community orchard on the back of that the asset of community value um, application was submitted in 2019, which didn't gain approval. Um, and in recent times, Brimscombe and Threat Parish have consulted on an emerging NDP where the site has been earmarked as a potential local green space. The site represents an infill development site, which is viewable from the AOMB, but is not considered to be of significant importance to the character of the settlement at this juncture, and therefore is in a, still in accordance with policy ES13, so it doesn't preclude development. So the proposal is for four detached units in a linear form um, with each unit set relatively central to the plot. So here we can see um, we've got the four detached units. In the center is the protected walnut tree um, and, and then maintained as open, but open down at the bottom of the site as well, the south. And the public right of way as part of this proposal would change its route from currently, it, it runs along up here, although on, on site at the moment, it's not clear, clearly defined as that route, although there is obviously the, the mapped route with GCC. Um, and then uh, the units, just to go through some from some concerns on distances and impact to the uh, occupants of Queen's Court, which is here to below. And it's a set back from the southern boundary here, uh, 17, between 17 and 21 metres, and then to the actual back of Queen's Court. So facing, any wind glazing facing would be between 26.5 and 34 metres away. And so therefore in accordance with the adopted residential design guide, um, which states a minimum of 25 metres move on so and um, the the plots are um degree of setback with the buildings being set into the bank um they're approximately six meters in height um and then three meters from from the rear as you can see with this side section they're set into set into the bank um so on this section just for context i've put um the view on site up to the dwelling set up here and then this is down into queen's court um, so we can see the site section of where the development would be located. Um, the site layout maintains an open central communal area, as, as said, surrounding the protected tree and rewriting the public right of way. Um, the boundary de details are conditioned, although it is um, indicated as walling and um, fencing. So uh, the development context surrounding the site's varied, ranging from Victorian red villas, uh, red brick villas, Bradstone bungalows, as well as Queen's Court, which is a mid-century modernist flat roof ex-local authority housing block. The, the proposals are two-storey contemporary flat roof dwellings set into the hillside. And the design approach is welcomed and offers an interesting juxtaposition between the linear form of development above and then of Queen's Court below. Um, put the floor plans so they are all four four bed units um so with living kind of the main living areas upstairs 
from the proposed materials of timber cladding and natural stone in combination with the flat roof so to offer to offer a softer roof line from the hillside setting conditions are also surrounding materials the edges of the development are maintained as green and offer an open outlook due to the relative low density of the site to balance the built form and the sense of openness um, and the proposed linear layout is um, considered to be compatible with this part of the settlement and because of the design form and layout it would therefore not be strident within um, the street scene or within the um, AOMB the setting of the AOMB which is obviously very important given that it's set below um, and then in, in kind of the sloping land and then it, it, at the dippy so that's obviously important consideration whilst on site some um, um, we discussed trees, so I've just included this plan, which is for a tree retention and removal plan. You can see that around the access points into the site, those three trees are to be to be removed, and five trees in total would be removed. But then we've got tree protection, so just because it clearly defines the ones that are remaining, especially to the southern boundary, um, and then the protection zones for hedging um, on site and for the tree and the fencing, um, tree protection fencing for construction, um, and then works as well for coppiced retaining trees. The application was supported by a tree survey um, and no objection was received by the tree officer subject to conditions um, for both um, services, moling, um, but also uh, for the, it to be carried out in accordance with the tree survey. Um, another constraint for the site is the access. Um, as I mentioned, it's a narrow lane, um, which is very um, is also steep. Uh, it's a gradient, so um, the proposal offers sufficient visibility displays and an optimised gradient for the for the new dwellings. Um, each unit has sufficient parking to accommodate in excess of two cars plus garage space, therefore exceeding the requirements of the adopted space standards within the local plan. Um, and uh, the the visibility as indicated here, 47 metres to the Y and 41 metres up the hill, up the hill is considered sufficient and acceptable in highway safety terms. Um, and so the development has demonstrated safe and secure means of access with no detrimental import, impacts to highway safety. Um, so that's for the four units um, and GCC have offered no objection subject to conditions. Um, but all, of course, there's also then the access to the main road to the A419. So there's off-site works that are proposed. Um, so the junction uh, visibility at the A419 um, would be brought up to standard 2.4 by 2.4 meters setback by 120 meters, which is considered acceptable. But also an improvement over the existing un, unsuitable access. Um, and it proposed that the road, road would be improved by a carriageway widening to 4.5 meters with a 1.5 meter wide footway along the east side of the road. So um, this has been confirmed that the, the measurements are, are correct in terms of that the 4.5 meters and the 1.5 meter uh, footpath can be accommodated without removing um, or prejudicing land for Queen's Court in terms of parking space and that the, the measurements are, are correct and sufficient. Um, I can understand there were there were concerns that and comments received that it wouldn't be and that's because the prior um, transport assessment which was objected to by highways were the measurements given within that were not workable. And then if we go to the London Road at the bottom, we can see that there's a new foot uh, crossing, pedestrian crossing, which is tactile crossing, um, which is considered to be suitable. An assessment was submitted within the transport assessment um, to demonstrate that this would be a suitable um, solution to enable people to then walk from the site, not only from the site, but also through the site, through the public right of way and from the surrounding houses down um, on the new footpath and then cross over to then access on the other side of the canal where, where there's a, a bridge and then to get onto the canal towpath. Um, so that's just briefly covering covering the highways which we can if there are any further questions we can go through that um, and that's road gradient. So that kind of finishes an, an overview of the most pertinent issues. Um, the, all other technical matters have been resolved and we can discuss if there are quite specific questions but and um, the the officer recommendation is for um 
permission subject to conditions. Um, Chair, can I just ask members of the committee, were they, have they um, seen the late representation received just to check and that you've managed to have a chance to read that before the meeting? That's great. Thank you very much. Yeah, I was going to say if anybody hasn't seen it, there are copies at the back of the chamber. But if you all have, that's great. Okay, uh, so we move on to public speaking. And we've got ward member, Councillor Tricia Watson. Um, have you got a card in your mic there, Tricia? Do you want to, is it working? Oh, of course, it's working. Yeah. We're not using cards tonight. That's fine then. Um, okay, you don't have a time limit. So off you go. <laughs> I'm speaking today as a district councillor for this area, expressing a strong objection to the development, knowing I have the full support of the local community. I've reviewed previous applications, spoken with numerous residents and the parish council about it over the years, read countless emails and letters on the matter, including prior to my election. I supported my parents during a similar succession of planning attempts on the field next to their house, just along the Brimscombe Valley many years ago, which thankfully remains a vital green space for nature today, supporting orchids, mammals and numerous birds. I fervently hope that committee feels able to return a similar decision for the site neighbours today. Please forgive my exercising councillor prerogative to take significantly more than the four minutes allotted to others. So many issues have been raised to me. I just want to make sure that you're aware of them all. Some, I fear, may put the council at significant risk if this application is approved tonight. My main representation is to highlight and redress the balance of the apparent bias and misrepresentations throughout these three applications for this site, um, which form the basis of the current developer premise. They claim it's not a val valuable community space, that it has no ecological value, that safe road access improvements are achievable, and a few nice big houses will make better use of the space. Looking first to some planning facts, I believe it goes against the emerging local plan to retain green spaces along this ribbon development to maintain the unique character of this valley landscape so near the AONB boundary. It violates national planning policy framework regarding open space and recreation, meeting none of the clearly defining limited exceptions when such can be replaced with housing. It goes against the district five-year plan, which aligns with a national framework aiming to optimize public spaces for public well-being. The district plan goes well beyond national ambition regarding the natural world with very clear protections for ecology and biodiversity, all of which are being totally dismissed here based on flawed and outdated information. It doesn't meet any identified local housing needs for smaller affordable homes. Instead, it further gentrifies the area to change its character and leave local residents priced out of the market. It breaches international conventions by taking away a vital public space for rest, recreation and leisure for local children and vulnerable residents. The current traffic recommendation starts on a false baseline. No traffic assessment was required when the flats were sold and refurbished a few years ago to reflect that car usage has changed significantly since they were built in the middle of the last century. Residents in these flats have woefully inadequate parking compared to current requirements and the access road onto the A419 is dangerous. This small parish is just about to have a very large development directly over the road from this site and the plans for developing Brimscombe Port are coming to fruition. More houses of this size and scale are simply not required and local infrastructure will struggle to cope with the disproportionate imminent influx of new people. Ironically, this small development has no obligation to contribute financially to improving any of the local amenities and will in fact significantly detract by removing a vital public space of ecological and social value. There are about 45 public comments on the planning portal, none of them in support. While some are from the same address, the site only has 33 neighbours. This is an overwhelming display of objection from the directly affected community. Many of the residents have taken the trouble to attend tonight, despite being not permitted to speak. A really powerful demonstration of the community's convictions that this application should not proceed and the lengths they are willing to go to in order to protect their valued amenity space. I poign poignantly remind all here that this whole site was in council ownership barely five years ago, sold off below market rates, I'm advised, due to the condition of the flats, when for reasons I can't comprehend now, refurbishing these as council flats was not deemed feasible. 
The land this application refers to was sold with the flats for their amenity and continued public use, as outlined on their purchase documents and verbally reassured to the buyers. If development was ever the intention, as the applicant claims, surely the council would have retained this playing field and orchard, as it's still called, to build more affordable housing on to replenish what had just been offloaded. There are 24 flats in Queen's Court, two or three bedrooms each, mostly multi-occupancy or families, including young children and vulnerable residents, at least one with declared disabilities plus their visitors. A few flats on the ground floor have small gardens, others have none. So we're talking about 20 to 30 people who rely on this proposed development area as their only directly usable, accessible, safe outdoor space beyond the small car park. And a further 20 or more residents also enjoy it to supplement their very limited garden space that goes with their flats. The landowner is applying to develop the current communal outdoor area for private gain without their support as joint leaseholders. The landlord has not fulfilled the standard of refurbishment to make the flats safe and sanitary for the current residents, including unresolved sewage and flat roof issues, dangerous fire escapes, inadequate parking, and still no sign of the promised access to bin lorries. Even in the junction improvements proposed here, that hasn't been covered. This violates the residents' health and safety, as well as the terms of their lease. If approved, this development eradicates a vital local communal area and green space with totally misrepresented significant biodiversity benefit to secure private profit at everyone else's loss. The current flat owners stand to get no financial or other gain from this development, despite their joint leasehold ownership of the land. Based on landlord behaviour to date, reinvestment in the building is sadly not anticipated. We have the chance to redeem the situation through rejecting this development, supporting the parish request to register it as an asset of community value. If we permit the development, the majority of the space is irrevocably lost to a few executive homes with a tree and a footpath through the middle. I'm gonna list out a number of inaccuracies and exaggerations stated in the application, which appear to be taken at face value by highways and planning council officers recommending approval of the application. Also various significant aspects have been glossed over in reports to decision makers. The council's own historical records and OS map designations have been kind of disregarded though, except what Nick spoke of earlier about the designations. More importantly, the single ecological assessment carried out for a previous application and never repeated was woefully inadequate and is ripe for challenge. Um, I'll go into specifics now regarding the road and parking. The DCC schedule to guide the decision today starts by saying access is off Bourne Lane. It isn't, that's the other side of Toadsmoor. This is an offshoot of London Road, clearly labelled on the maps. If this basic fact is wrong, it doesn't give me huge confidence that the more complex elements have been fairly and accurately represented. As everyone admits, access to and from the A419 is currently unsafe. No transport assessment was done when Queen's Court was redeveloped, but out of necessity, the developer is including junction improvements in this application. They chose not to make these as part of the flats redevelopment. I sincerely hope that County haven't let the opportunity to improve a dangerous junction at someone else's expense cloud their judgment on the project as a whole. And should this application not be successful, I hope we can all find a way of supporting some safety improvements another way. Queen's Court already has fewer parking spaces than will be permitted in a new build application. Any redevelopment of the site should first and foremost seek to address that as the site owner is responsible for them too. Ironically, planning has been refused for a new flat within the current building due to inadequate parking on site, which the landlord has refused to resolve. Use of the parking spaces is covered in resident leases, so any plans that reduce this space without their consent cannot rightfully be approved. Um, I was advised that the claimed access road width in one of the developer applications was not physically possible without removal of parking spaces, although again the officer tonight has suggested that the current one is viable. Um, however, the planned expended splay of the junction to the east of the access road has no option but to erode parking facilities, which isn't mentioned at all. The side junction with the pavilion restaurant is already dangerous and removing some of their land display to that side is not gonna increase the safety there. Just wanna point out that the description of the current access road usage disingenuously reflects actual property numbers. Nine properties plus Queen's Court is actually 33 properties 
plus a restaurant and takeaway next door, significantly higher usage than is implied. Uh, 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 the quoted traffic movements, um, it suggests in one of the documents that we're going to have 0.1 peak hour additional traffic movements. Four executive homes with two cars each, even allowing for flexible hours and working from home. I don't think that that's even remotely feasible. And I'd just like to point out the nearest primary and secondary schools are not within walking distance. Very little, if any, public transport is safely walkable without mobility, with any mobility impairments, with small children or for pushchairs. In summary, the long awaited highways assessment appears to contain fundamental flaws, so should not be taken at face value, and I urge that it's referred back for reconsideration. Moving on to the public amenity space, a fact denied by the applicant due to the current ownership and some question over the designations in different documents. The play area is acknowledged back in 1973. It was then furnished with parish funded equipment. This was removed when it reached the end of life and was replaced with a shelter for older youths which has since been relocated while the flats were redeveloped. Noted as such on the OS maps, it's never stopped being used as a public amenity, a total contradiction to what's heavily implied in many documents being used to devalue its current role. The current documentation omitting appropriate designations should not preclude all evidence to the contrary and I believe is open to legal challenge. The only temporary reduction in community use was while the flats were empty and being refurbished. And even then its use continued by walkers and neighbors. The current Queen's Court occupiers have all adopted the land as their own, as they believed it was when they moved in. And they've repeatedly tried to work with the community and parish to maintain the space better than the current owner. Offers of purchase, community management and parish designation applications are all evidence of these efforts, not covered in any reports that were given to tonight's panel. Local community use is clearly ongoing and will, needed, will be needed even more once the floodplain development on the other side of the A419 is inhabited. I believe there's approximately 100 residences going in here. There's precious little else in this area of the valley to meet their local leisure and recreational needs. The unfenced footpath through the middle further entrenches it as a public space. While ramblers agree a divert is just about acceptable, they also rightly objected. This is no, not the same as a walk through a wild green area, which is so important to health and well-being. In summary, the area was confirmed to be a public amenity space in 1973. And as there's no evidence of legal change of use along the way, just transfer of ownership from the council, we believe it's therefore protected by national planning policy. I'm afraid I'm gonna harp on now about the ecological value. Many trees will be lost to widen the road at all points substantial visual and noise impact to all the residents. They're currently a valuable screen from the main road and building site opposite. Losing these trees a fair distance away from the development site would be a significant environmental loss with no prospect of replacement. The application only details the loss of, I think it's four or five trees on the site boundary. There's no mention of all the roadside trees that will be cut down and replaced with tarmac. And note that only the central walnut tree is legally preserved. So all trees on the site are realistically at risk. The current green space between the houses is an integral part of the precious landscape of this ribbon development, which feathers into the AONB and provides an invaluable wildlife corridor. Sacrificing this to houses, saying the boundary hedgerows are adequate corridors is naive at best, particularly as some of these hedges are scheduled to go during the build. Suggesting that reducing the size of the public space to a small middle section around the tree and building houses is betterment of the site is frankly offensive based on a false premise that the land is somehow inferior as wild space. The whole site could and should have been better managed since the change of ownership, as could the flats. The current landlord has chosen to actively degrade the site rather than manage it, and the council have unquestionably overlooked this failure by restating the flawed assertion that's in a poor ecological state. Sensible stewardship in place at time of sale would have seen it flourish, as is evident elsewhere in the valley. Nature valiantly re-establishing itself was noted at the site visit and is evidenced by residents in many of their communications. Disturbingly, residents have described acts of environmental vandalism to reduce the ecological value of the site. Trees were hacked back to ground level early on, although thankfully these have shown significant regrowth in the intervening few years and are marked on the latest plans. Tree clearance and an aggressive comprehensive flail mow took place just prior to the single ecological survey to ensure displacement of any resident fauna and minimal identifiable foliage. 
precious little land management has taken place since, further suggesting this action was taken deliberately to skew the survey findings. I don't understand how that original survey with such a damning history can still be accepted as relevant to this, the third application for this site. A few years on, nature has overcome that abuse. There's a great range of biodiversity on site, which is downplayed in the officer's report to yourselves. The natural resilience and replenishment shows what a valuable site it actually is in a cohesive, broader natural corridor. Residents have reported sightings of reptiles, as we briefly mentioned in the DCC report. That includes lizards, grass snakes, slow worms, and even adders. The space is alive with birds and insects as the seasons progress. The presence of bats further demonstrates the vibrant insect population. Deer and other small mammals are often seen with owls and buzzards preying in the area. The bottom of that food chain will drop out unless the new house owners happen to want to garden for wildlife, which sadly is not often the case in new expensive dwellings where looks tend to take on more importance than ecological contribution. Garden pesticides are often prevalent, additional lighting is part and parcel and pets are often a feature. A recent parish application to register the space as an asset of community value in line with the parish plan was rejected. One of the reasons was due to the owner wanting to build on the site. How messed up is our planning system if that's a valid reason when the constant threat of development is exactly why this protection was being sought? So in summary, on the ecological side of things, a single survey was carried out for a previous planning application at a time when the site had been deliberately raised to the ground to, to falsify the findings. This cannot be relied on a third time to support any claim of ecological deficit a few years on when evidence to the contrary is plain to see. A couple of other planning details I want to pick up on. Overlooking of the flats from uphill is almost too obvious to state, despite the developer assertions of ample distance. The houses with their living space on the upper floors of this steep slope will significantly overlook the privacy of all flat dwellers, and this is going to be worse if the, any trees are removed. A couple of previous planning application rejections included feathering the edge of the development boundary, so near the AO and B, and needing to demonstrate a neutral impact to any existing residents. It's of course negative for all the local residents, which is why they're all here tonight. And the ecology through the loss of amenity land and green space, I've illustrated in my words so far. None of these re reasons for rejection have changed, and I don't understand why they no longer apply this time. The apparent omission of a designation of public space um, is far from clear cut. There's document inconsistencies and usage examples that could be used to challenge this and should not be summarily dismissed based on a biased landowner's assertion that the land was sold to them for development. The council's own report recognizes the good links this land forms with neighboring ecological sites and nature's corridors are now acknowledged as absolutely crucial in restoring any kind of viable ecosystem in our desecrated countryside. The parish and local community have repeatedly demonstrated there is a desire to take on and manage this land sustainably in conjunction with the neighbouring Charlie Gardens, a welcome contrast to the neglect it suffered from the current owners. Passing this application will encourage other landowners to apply similar techniques of eco-vandalism to be rewarded with planning permission, leading to further environmental degradation and land slipping out of public grasp, particularly where there's conflicting proposals at play like here. This case is literally a race to see what gets approved first. The local plan, appeal against the apparently flawed ACB rejection, or this. The developer has won the race to get the first hearing, thereby denying the other two options a look-in if we put the approval through tonight. Bear with me, I'm nearly done. I appreciate that past mistakes and local anecdotes are not adequate in themselves to give you cause to turn down a planning application. To that end, I'll quote a number of regulatory and planning references that apply to the various points I've spoken on. We've got HC1, small scale housing need within defined settlements, which includes loss of open space and habitat. ES6, biodiversity. ES7, landscape character. ES13, protection of existing open space. And the National Planning Policy Framework, paragraph 174 and a number of others. And one resident raised to me today that there's also some directly relevant UN human rights considerations in articles 30 and 31 regarding the rights of recreation for children and those with disabilities, all of whom live in the flats. There's a real risk of legal challenge from the leaseholders and local residents if all of these aspects are not properly considered. 
I urge all councillors here tonight to do the right thing for our community and the natural world by rejecting this development, which goes against international conventions, national planning policy and local plan intentions. Protect this little corner of the Brimscombe Valley from ever more insidious infill and allow the community instead to enhance this valuable ecological space for continued use as public amenity. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Tricia. Uh, now we have Brimscombe and Thrupp Parish Council, Tim Harris. If you can come to the public microphone, I'm not sure which one, that one there. Okay, Katie, yeah. Uh, you'll have four minutes. Again, we don't have a clock on the screen, unfortunately. Right. Um, if you could Thank you very much. Four, I'll, cut, I'll have to cut you off if you do go over four minutes. I'll try and give you a warning if it looks like you're going to get there. After Councillor Watson's uh, presentation, I, there's not much need, I need to add, I don't think. Okay, so I'm t speaking tonight on behalf of Brimscombe and Thrupp Parish Council. Um, we've really got only three points to make in addition to what's been made so far. Firstly, I think, you know, it's important to understand that we in the parish are not against development, quite the reverse. We're actively participating with the Strad District Council port development team to make sure that the port development, which is half a mile away, if that, um, is a success. We're really keen to see that um, go on. We're welcoming 105 new houses into Wimberley Park, which although isn't in the parish, is right hard by our border and is less than half a mile away from this green space. Longer term, there's 100 houses or 105, I think, um, okayed for Ham Mill, which we've not seen any movement on, but you know that's another welcome development to uh, improve housing provision in the parish. And of course, there's another 37 that are outlined for Brimscombe Mills as well in the, in the future as well. None of these, are, those last two are not subject to immediate action, but they're there on thing. So we're looking at welcoming another 300 odd homes into the parish over the next few years. And this is a parish of 774 homes at the moment. So we're looking at a 50% increase in our um, domestic population in terms of properties over the next years. So you might think that, oh, well, another what's another four is not going to make any difference to that. But to my mind, this really underlines our first Point, which is the preservation of green space like this, where we've got an amenity area right hard by people's homes that need to use it as a play area. Um, and it's been, you know, I mean, I've lived in the parish for 37 years and it's always been a play area since I've been there, you know, it's like, um, it's always been called a play area. So that's really important. It's really important to preserve these small areas. The second point the parish wants to make is about the, um, uh, the um, the unity of uh, objection in the um, local population. We don't see that hardly at all. And then the third point, a uh, fourth third point, is just about the NDP. Yes, the NDP isn't ready yet. That's because we had a big hiatus during the pandemic. I've only been on the parish council since 2020. We've rejuvenated the. Uh, neighborhood development plan. It's currently going into regulation 14 and it's uh, the uh, area under proposal is a designated local green space in that. It, we, it meets all the criteria of green space. The objection from the developer is that it's overgrown, it's on a steep bank and nobody uses it. And we've heard how people use it. If it's on a steep bank and it's too steep for people to walk across and enjoy it, why is it not too steep for people to live on you know it just doesn't seem right to us it's we're used to living on steep banks we live in the Brimscombe Valley you know it's like we're used to that um and then the uh, the last point about it not being used we've you know we know it's yeah it's not been being used because the owners have neglected it for the last few years and let it overgrow properly managed it's a vital green space and so the parish council joins with the local residents and councillor Watson in asking you to turn down this application. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Um, and now we've got Charles Bignall speaking in opposition. I should be speaking on behalf of the res residents who are objecting. Uh, again, you've got four minutes. I'll, I'll give you a shout if you get within about 20 seconds of, of your four minutes and I'll have to cut you off if you do go over. 
I address you this evening as the spokesperson of the communities surrounding the play area who are unanimous in their opposition to this application and who have come to this meeting to demonstrate that opposition. Could I please ask those opposed to raise their hands? We are here today to protect the play area, a site subjected to the developer's playbook of make a bad application, make a second bad application, and then put in something reasonable. I would remind the committee that many of the reasons for the previous applications failing remain today, and none of them are addressed in this application. You've already heard the sound planning, ecological and emotional reasons for refusing this application, as well as the issues at Queen's Court and the doubts about the developer. These are compelling grounds to reject this application, but it will, however, present legitimate grounds upon which this committee can refuse this application. Before I do, I'd like to highlight a number of points. Firstly, the planning permission was granted for the playing area in March 1973. It's no less relevant today than it was 50 years ago. I'm no planning expert, but I was able to discover this planning decision. One could rightly expect that an expert in planning, such as the applicant, would be able to do, establish the fact too. Yet in paragraph 2.4 of the application, it states, the site has never been designated or utilized as public open space or any type of public use. This is clearly wrong and must lead one to doubt the rest of the application. Paragraph 2.7 of the application is also misleading when it states that the play area would fall within the definition of previously developed land. Nothing could be further from the truth and can be witnessed by residents who have lived in the area for the last 50 years. The committee can refuse this application under paragraphs 98 to 103 of the current National Planning Policy Framework, which covers open space and recreation. Paragraph 98 of the NPPF states, access to open spaces for physical activities is important for the health and well-being of communities and can deliver wider benefits for nature and support efforts to address climate change. More importantly, paragraph 99 states, existing open space, sports and recreational buildings and land, including playing fields, should not be built on unless an assessment has been undertaken, which has clearly shown the open space buildings or land to be surplus to requirements, or the loss resulting from the proposed development will be replaced by equivalent or better provision in terms of quantity and quality in a suitable location. Please note, paragraph 99 deals with playing fields, not children's playgrounds or play equipment, but fields in which the community play, relax, walk and socialise, a field such as the play area. The community have demonstrated that play area is not surplus to requirements. No assessment has taken place, nor did the community want the play area developed. For the pro-developer officer's report to claim the development has a neutral effect should be rigorously challenged. The current owner has done nothing to, to maintain the site other than to mow it just before the survey. Any erosion of amenity value by a landowner should not be rewarded with planning permission, especially as Charlie Community Gardens offer to take on the play area. The play area is the lung of Queen's Court where there is little and no provision of green space. It's hard up against a main road, railway and 104 house development, which indicates an increased need for the play area to remain undeveloped. Very In closing, I implore... In closing, I implore the committee to do the right thing for the local community and refuse this application based on the requirements under the open space and recreation paragraphs of the NPPF. Thanks. Okay, um, now move on to questions from members. Anybody? Uh, Lorraine, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a few. I'll start with an easy one. <clears throat> I have written it down here. Can we go back to the graphic that shows the access with the lane? Not that one. No. No. Not that one. It's in much closer than that. No. No. Keep going. In fact, you'll get there eventually. No. Say again. No, it's got. You, 
keep going, we won't get there in a second. It's got um, the lane and the access into the site. Ah, there you go. Can we make this a bit bigger? Oh, not quite that much, sorry. I want to see the, the lane. Shut it over a bit. Okay, come go up a little bit so we can see the rest of the lane. Sorry, the other way. Go, keep going, keep going. That's it, that's perfect. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so they want to widen the lane and the access. So the sandy coloured bit along the side of the boundary, you you know where I, I see where I am. Um, where's the footpath going? That is that is the footpath. That's the footpath. Yeah. Okay. So the lane has been widened. The footpath is in. Where's the hedge? The hedging for that section would would be removed, oh, or and then we need the hedge. Okay. Right, that, thank you, you've answered that question. I'll come to the others later. Everyone else can have a turn. Yes, Mark and then Lindsay. Thank you. Um, whilst it's a, a, a detail on the on the edge of this application, really, um, but could we have some comment with regards to the status of the land at the time that the district council sold the land, just in terms of the clarification. Um, my point here is that the applicant in one of their submissions before committee stated that it was sold with development potential. Now I'm quite clear that the district council wouldn't have sold the land um, with any uh, hint towards planning, um, but I think it is important to note that my understanding is that the, um, there's a, obviously quite a long history to this site and the use of this site, but essentially what we're looking at here is private land that was sold with no covenants or limitations as to the usage of that private land, and there was no protection or designation to that land to confirm the previous usage. So on the point of selling the land with development potential, can I just be clear that um, there, were, there was no indicative uh, development at, uh, in mind at that time and that no assurance was given to the buyer um, at the time of the sale of the land. So in, 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 in essence, the, the council sold the land with basically as the current usage for upgrade of the flats um, and with no intention to do anything with the open space. Um, is it possible to comment to that? I understand it's on the edge of this determination, but I just wanted to have some clarity there. Um, I'll try to answer. Um, so the obviously I don't know the exact specifics of when it when it was when it was sold. I know that um, I did ask for information in terms of covenants, etc. And I was so I, behind the scenes and was showing documents. I didn't see any covenant that would suggest that this land couldn't be developed. Um, if that were to exist, obviously that's at the applicant's own risk. So if it were to gain planning permission and there was a, such a covenant that would stop development, then then that's their problem as such. So, um, but if so, it would have been sold as the, as the site, but the specifics is the, of what was communicated at what time, um, obviously a site's bought by the applicant knowing the current conditions. Okay, thank you. Um, and the second question is just on the wider view here. Um, I wanted to see what other public open spaces um, were available to uh, to these residents. Uh, nearby, it looks like a large area of common behind. Uh, am I correct in that assumption? Uh, 
Um, so yes, so this this plan shows the kind of public rights of way and then the site, um, but also so there is there is linkages up to open countryside here, um, and then also uh, across the road to the to the canal um, and the opportunities recreational opportunities along there, um, and then also yes, you've got the Charlie Community Gardens next next door. So that there are opportunities very close to the site. Thank you. Yeah, having been brought up as a teenager there, the, 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 it's not actually common land, but the open land up above is, is widely used for recreational purposes, especially by teenagers with a taste for cider. Right. Uh, any more questions? Um, Lindsay, I had you and then Helen. Thank you. Um, just following on from um, Lorraine and the, uh, the lane going up, um, can we go back to the slide that we were on when Lorraine, um, obviously Lorraine has um, highlighted that a lot of the hedgerow is going to be taken out and you put a pathway in. When we've done the site visit, I really cannot see how that pathway and widening of that lane is going to be done without taking away some of the Queen's Court parking. I'm really struggling to see how that can be done without detriment to the parking. And we already know that it's, there's really, I mean, when we were there, there was very, very little parking. Um, and I'm really concerned about that, to be honest. Um, Chair, we have um, a representative of the Highway Authority here who, who may be best placed. Uh, Mike, if you wouldn't mind to comment on that. Thank you. Good evening, Chair. Um, I understand uh, from the planners and obviously from the red line that that land is within the applicant's ownership. Uh, and it's, uh, that's why the width of the access road and footway were reduced so that it didn't encroach onto the Ocean Court uh, land. Okay, so, so sorry, so yes, yeah, so the, um, as I said, prior assessments um, have been objected to by highways because of the encroachment into Queen's Court um, and potential then loss of parking, um, where this assessment um, to which is, is getting no objection from highways has demonstrated that it can be accommodated. So it's 4.5 metres um, for the, the carriageway and then 1.5 metre for the footway. Um, and whilst to the actual road, the hedging would you know, or the, the verge would be removed to accommodate that. The um, vegetation within the Queen's Court boundary would, would remain, obviously, that could to maybe damage, but could regrow back. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Sorry, we, okay, we can't have it. I know, it's okay. I understand. Yes. Um, Sorry, we can't have interruptions from the public, though. Okay, sorry. Uh, sorry, Lindsay, yes. So where where have we found this extra space? Sorry, just just from taking out the vegetation, is that what you're saying? So the the prior assessment had um, the road was wider and so was the, pub, the, the, the footpath was wider. So there was a, a, an earlier assessment. The this assessment that's gained no objection with the 4.5 metres and the 1.5 metre footpath can be accommodated without um, prejudicing or removing car parking from Queen's Court. Okay, I've got quite a few more people to come in with questions. I've got Helen next, if you finish, Lindsay. Yeah, uh, Helen, then Jenny, Lorraine and... Who else? Sorry, just a minute. Who else had the hand up? Lucas, thanks. Um, hi. So I, I, I feel that in the overall picture, this is probably a minor issue. But um, Nick, you said today that these proposed detached luxury houses are going to be four bedroom and that the living space is going to be on the first floor and that they will be built into the hillside. 
Can you just confirm the arrangements for ventilation of the bedrooms on the lower floor, please? Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, so uh, if I'd show you a section here, you can see that the, the, the rear of the properties are set in, it, they are clear of the bank and then they've got their, the terrace to the rear. So they're not actually in the back wall isn't into the ground. Um, so it's working with the topography, but it's not set in. So, so it's not underground. Sorry, the, the, the rear of the property does look like it will be into the hillside. So the, the rear of the property is here. So you've got the frontage with the, with, um, the veranda or, or terrace. So this is the back here, which is then a rear terrace. So uh, this is obviously the land and this is the back of the property, which is not in the ground. It's, it's free for air. Uh, so the garages will be underground, is that correct? So, and so both floors of living space will be above ground. I think um, I think I'm right to say if we go back to the to the elevations. Sorry, Nick. So the, the principal elevation there obviously shows two stories. So you've got glazing and uh, and ventilation to those habitable rooms on the ground floor. So I think where there are rooms, then they would be secondary bathrooms, etc. They in the back or just access. Yes. So um, things like utility. So all functional rooms. But I, I have to say that this isn't something that which I, I know we've touched on before, this is something more that building regulations would need to look at as and when. So rather than issues of ventilation, et cetera, aren't really issues that we tend to drill down to when we look at schemes like this. But it does look as if those rooms will have ventilation to habitable rooms and light. OK, I've got Jenny, then Lorraine and Lucas. Jenny. I just want to clarify my understanding. As it's a tier three and the presumption is in favour of development, but obviously this has a lot of local opposition. So are the officers saying that the presumption in favour of development has overridden that local feeling and you couldn't defend turning it down? Thank you for your, thank you for your question. Um, so uh, the officer report obviously goes through the issues and then the planning balance. So um, it's the, the use of the site um, it's, and then its designation or not. Um, and then all of the material planning considerations and then bal balanced it out um, at the end for to come to the recommendation. So in virtue of the recommendation, it was not felt that a refusal could be sustained. Um, and that was the planning, the, the planning balance exercise that was undertaken. Lorraine. Would you like me to do all of mine at once or shall I? OK. Right. First one. 2019 refused erection of four dwellings. 2019 refused erection, um, erection of eight dwellings. What has changed between then and now that it was refused then? We didn't obviously like it, and it is now um, approved. Not approved. Thank you for your question. Yes, so there has been... Um, a few applications as, as has been stated previously. Um, the last application was for four dwellings and had five refusal reasons um, surrounding CP14 of poor design and layout, um, not responding to the contextual setting, um, HC1 out of keeping with the pattern form of development at this location. Um, so those four dwellings, there was one extremely large unit and um, then there was one above another uh, so rather than being in a linear form. Um, uh, there was biodiversity um, refusal, um, as there was there weren't there wasn't an addendum or anything that the, the information submitted was insufficient. Um, and then also in terms of landscape and also a tree refusal. So there was many refusals to that. In this instance, there was no objection from the tree officer. It, the layout responds to to the protected tree. 
um, there was no objection in terms of um, biodiversity um, and then in terms of the design and layout. Uh, so therefore, it, the contemporary approach, flat roof, um, being of a linear form and of a scale that's um, a, compatible with the development around. So those refusal reasons were felt to be overcome on this application. And no, 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 no. the development was, uh, who's going to manage? It says it's going to be managed. Who's going to manage it? At this time, we don't know. That's um, conditioned. That, so that it's conditioned so that we have all of that information um, to tie into the landscape and ecological management plan, um, which includes the open space. So, so from an ecological, but also from a, a, a usability um, that it is ma managed. So we would need to agree those details. They'd need to be submitted to us. And enforce them if necessary, I would assume. Of course. Okay. And? Uh, no overlooking. No, I'll get back to that in a second. Um, boundary planting, vegetation. We need to look at the coloured pictures for that. Just hold on a minute. Right, there's, a, there's another one I wanted to ask you. The proposed scheme bent based on a digital measured survey. Is this the bit with the blue tracking for the seven and a half ton truck? Was that a digital model, or did somebody actually did someone actually drive it? Because I do drive one. That, right? I drive a seven and a half ton truck, and I, that lane as it stands is one I would avoid at all costs. And I don't see where, without taking a huge chunk out of the right hand side, it would make it easy for me to drive my seven and a half ton truck around that both of those bends. That's so you don't have to answer that. That's um, right. So. Hang on, let me go back to the, the boundary planning. Can we have the, oh, sorry. Can we have the colored picture of the um, elevation that shows the houses and the, what I presume is their drive, where they're gonna drive their car along? No, oh, well, no, ah, yes, go on, go back. Side, sideways on, I think it was, sort of. No, keep going. It's coloured. No. It shows the um, topography, if you like, went with a, a grey... Not that one. Ah, hang on, go back. Go back. No, it's not that. Try that one up there. Keep going. No, no. Ah. Right. Okay. Keep that picture in your mind because there's your driveway for the cars. Yeah. Now, can you show me the one where you see the houses built into the not the line drawing, the, yeah, kind of like that. Yeah, kind of like that. So how do you get from where the cars are going up to the house? Is it steps? No, it's not proposed to step. So it's, it's, it's proposed to be so that it's level or, 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 or sloped. But how, it, sorry, how can it be level if the house is built on that amount of foundation into the hill and the, and the roadway driveway is below that? I'm puzzled with that one. I think it's, it's because you, you would drive in at what is the ground floor level of the property, but the living accommodation, so the kitchen lounge area, is on the first floor. So they would drive the, drive to the property and then access the property from the lower ground floor where the bedroom accommodation is, if you, if you see what I mean. The reason I ask this is because I live in a house built like this. Our houses are built on top of the garages. And when you go in through the front door, you have to go upstairs to get to the house. And the garden's upstairs, which sounds really odd, but it is. Um, and the way that's built into the hill, it doesn't show how you're going to get upstairs. 
if, are those stairs? Uh, as, yeah. as, stairs? So it's inside? As it's inside, okay, that's yes. Right, that's right. Okay. Um, hang on. My other one was... Yeah, can we show the picture of the... Um, looking from the proposed build down onto the existing flats that shows the trees? Please. That one. That's the one. You see, when we went and visited it, the trees have still got quite a lot of leaves on them. Before long, there won't be any. And unless the bill are going to be built much deeper into the bank, can you explain how with no leaves and the some of these trees being taken out, how is it not going to be overlooked? So um, as the report states, it's um, we have the distances set out within the residential design guide of being a minimum of 25 metres, which is without anything in between. So clear glazing to clear glazing. Um, so in this instance, they each plot exceeds 25 metres and therefore it's not unacceptable. It wouldn't in that in that in those conditions, we would consider that it wouldn't be detrimental to um, the amenity of the people of Queen's Court by overlooking. The reason I ask this is because of where I live and our living room is above the garages, which puts us in line, with the house across the road, bedroom windows. We have our pavement, the road, their pavement and their garden. And without their windows being closed, I can see people going back and forth in the bedroom. Just I don't think there's anything to respond to that. Okay. Are you done, Lorraine? Okay. Um, Lucas. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I heard the officer say, or at least I, I think I heard the officer say, well, on balance, I, re I recommend this application and I will not be able to defend it. So I, I didn't realize that, that the one followed from the other. Can you clarify that? Uh, Chair, may I, may I clarify that? Um, obviously, um, Nick's role as planning officer is to provide you with a recommendation based on his professional judgment. And he has, as part of the report, set out the, the factors that he thinks are important and he's addressed the planning balance in the report. And he's come to the conclusion that he believes that the um, that permission should be granted. So this is his professional view. So moving forward, dependent on what decision the committee make, uh, Nick would have to stick by that his personal view on that. That's not to say that another officer or another person couldn't take a, a different view dependent on, on the decision that the committee make. But, but Nick, but, but the professional requirement is that he has made this recommendation and it would not be appropriate for him to amend that or alter that in the future. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. So it's, the opinion is subjective. All planning opinion is subjective. Yes. Okay, thank you for that. Then um, the 1973 planning designation and being accepted as planning for play area, was that ever revoked? It, it wasn't, no. So planning permission was granted um, as a play area. Yeah, so, so it got the plastic designation still as play area. The planning permission doesn't designate the land as a, a play area, but it was granted planning permission and um, play equipment was erected on the site. Okay, thank you. Then, is there any evidence that the developer has taken the interests of the existing leaseholders in Queen's Court itself into account with this development? Have any extra parking places been created? This could easily be done on all the land that's available to him? Uh, and has there any extra play, compensatory play and amenity area actually been enhanced? Is there any evidence of that? If I may, Chair. Um, 
it, would, it is not appropriate, I'm afraid, to, to give any sort of view from an officer point of view as to what the landowner has or has not done. All, all we can do is, is comment on the scheme that's presented to us. I fully so, appreciate that. Yes, so um, obviously the plans as shown do, do not show any additional car parking or, or other space for the residents of the existing Queen's Court. Thank you. I, I was wondering whether I'd missed something or not. Um, I think then also bin lorries were mentioned, so I don't know whether this is a highway thing or not, but do bin lorries presumably have to get up to those houses? Uh, can they now? Um, bin lorries will only go on adopted roads, so this won't be an adopted highway as such. Ah, so, so the bin lorry will not go up there. So what is the facility then for all these people getting their rubbish taken away? Um, that's a district council, a county council matter. Um, uh, they may have to have private private um, refuse disposal. Right, I would like the views of Ubico before I would give permission for this and support this application. I think there's already apparent difficulties for the residents of Queen's Court to get rid of their refuge. Uh, this exacerbates that and doesn't, what we often talk about in planning is planning gain. I see very little planning gain in this application, certainly not for the community. Thank you. In terms of um, refuse, there are, um, I personally live somewhere where um, bin lorries can't access. So I have a different arrangement still fulfilled by the district council um, where I have brown bags um, that I have to use instead of a wheelie bin. So um, yes, access in this instance is difficult, but um, refuse collection can still be carried out. Um, yeah, just quickly on the, on the question of um, presenting uh, uh, the planning authority's defence at, uh, at an appeal. I mean, it is, as, as uh, Jerry said, it is perfectly possible if, if the case officer um, was recommending permission and we refused, it is perfectly possible for another officer or even a member to present a defence, as in fact I did a couple of weeks ago um, on the Ashen Plains barn <coughs> refusal. I, I presented the the the, the, the defence, so you know that, that doesn't mean we can't defend uh, a refusal. Um, okay, I've got Victoria, and then somebody else put that. Martin, yeah, Victoria. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm taking a few issues a lot with the HC1, ES6, ES7, and a few policy framing work. But going back to the bin issue, does Gloucester Highways not have a 10 metre bin drag policy? in place. Um, yes, I think it's 25 metres uh, from the highway, but it's where that um, where that 25 metres would be taken from and where the storage would be. And is there any storage in the planning for this development at all, bin store? I think this, it, this Every case has to be determined on its own merit, so I can't comment on Ocean Court. This development would be too far for um, a wheelie bin to be transported out. Thank you. And um, just to, to follow up on that one, and we've said, Lorraine, I think it was yourself that said that the access to get inside the building is to go through a garage and then up the stairs into the living area. So how? How is a resident, if this does get permitted, going to dispose of their waste easily, safely? And I've got another question after that. Chairman, uh, just a few things. First of all, it, yeah, the, there is a ground floor to the properties. It's not just a garage. So, so they, so you, the way they're designed is you walk into a hallway. Yes. Is yes. that but, on the rear of this development, though? No, because that's not clear. Sorry. No, sorry, it so, may not be clear. So, fine. yeah, so that there, so, so there is accommodation on the ground floor. Where we've referred to living accommodation on the upper floor, we've meant those sort of habitable rooms which traditionally you'd find on somebody's ground floor, like yes. their lounge and kitchen. So sorry if that's been no, 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 that's fine. I live in a, yeah. I lived in an upside down, so I get yeah. the concept. Yeah. But um, okay, fine. Yeah. And then with so we can't get a refuge lorry 
up to this building. What about ambulance, fire brigade, safety access for all these residents? Um, if there's, you know, there's no room for a bin store, there's no room for, for a refuge lorry, what do we do about the possible if there's a fire or something? I'm not sure there's a wide enough splay. Um, I think in an emergency, an ambulance or a fire engine would be able to get to a property if they can get up that road. Um, which they would do. You think they would run those bends with the yes, seven ton lorry? Yeah. They wouldn't, wouldn't Lorraine, Yes, I think. because um, there is betterment coming from this application in terms of um, accessibility into this site. And as I say, uh, if there was a fire or somebody needed emergency treatment, an ambulance or a um, fire appliance would be able to get up through there. In that... Um in instance then, if uh, let's just say there was a housewarming party going on and there's lots of cars parked over there, would the ambulance officer going to have to go through the tree um, protected areas as well? Would that, is that something that would, would be happen? Something I that could, think, happen, could potentially happen? I think that would be a, an academic question for me. Okay. Okay, thank you. Right, Martin. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Nick. Um, to consider the the, gre the green open space, the community space, as it's been presented by local residents and the councillor, um, it remains, other than the public right of way on it, it remains privately owned land. So presumably even if the development doesn't happen the owner could deny local community use by fencing it off i suppose um if the the as i understand the parish council's ndp looks to designate it as uh green space as community space would that or anything else that might subsequently happen make it protect it for community use? Thank you. Thank you for the question. So, yes, the site's in private ownership. Um, so it's it could it could be blocked public access other than the public right of way on the delineate, delineated route could um, could could be stopped. Um, and then, yes, if through an NDP it was a designated as a local green space, which means it needs to meet the five tests through the MPPF as part of that process, and then, yes, it would be designated as such, so could preclude then development. Could preclude development, but would it guarantee any community access or is um so that that that's an, a nuance but if it's if it's private if it's privately owned i.e so not um publicly owned then it, it could still be it could still the the landowner could still stop people from accessing the site other than the public right of way yet yeah, other than the public right of way thank you Yes, Lucas. Um, so the land was deemed to be in public ownership when it was the ownership of Stroud District Council, which then created a play area in it in 1973. So what service have we done to the community by selling a public space that was used as a play area off to a private developer without public consultation? Chair, once again, I don't, I don't think that that's a subject that we can debate at committee today. The land is privately owned. Um, none of us around this table know what the sequence of events was that led to the, the, to the council selling that land, but it's not material to the consideration of your determination of this application. So I would stress that we move away from that subject. I, I appreciate the link and, and for the general public. But for your determination of that, this application, that is not a material consideration. So, um, as has been pointed out, the land, other than the footpaths, in theory, could be 
closed off to it for any access because it is privately owned land. And I was just having a quick conversation with, with the solicitor about what prescriptive rights may exist, but they that would have to be, I understand, and sorry to paraphrase you, Jeremy, but that would be for a 20 year period and that would have to show continuous use. So it would seem as if whilst the, um, it would seem as if whilst certainly in the 70s and 80s, yes, you know, that, that would be a use that could be attributed to this piece of land. We're now 30, 40 years on, and, and it's very difficult to, to attribute that same use at this stage of time. So, but I, I, I don't see the benefit, I'm afraid, and I would advise members not to dwell too heavily on why the land was sold, when it was sold, etc. I, I can accept that. However, it is still designated as a play area. No, as, as Nick's explained, it's not actually designated. It, it got planning permission as a play area, which then allowed... And the used as a play to, area. Well, yeah, it, it was allowed, that allowed play equipment to be put on it, but it doesn't yeah. actually designate it as a designated play area, is what I think Nick was saying. Um, and, and, you know, as Jerry's saying, the, the issues around land ownership and how it was sold, how it was bought, etc., are, are really civic civil civil matters um, and not, not not material planning considerations um, whatever the views of the community and members might be on those things um, right uh, do we have any more questions Lucas do you have, did you have any more questions no okay um, obviously you can address those issues in in debate but as Jerry said it, it probably doesn't move us forward really to debate things that aren't material considerations that are really civil matters, unfortunate as we may view them, having been in the past. We are where we are, as we often say in planning. Yes, Lorraine. Oh, sorry, I thought you put, I thought you put, sorry, I thought, I thought you had another question. Any more questions? If not, then um, we're going to need, a, sorry, oh. Um, yeah, I was going to look for a proposer. Um, does anybody wish to propose either the officer recommendation to permit or alternatively propose refusal? Uh, yes, Helen. Okay, I have a seconder for refusal. Lindsay, okay, that's fine. We've got a proposer and a seconder. Yep. Um, and we need before we actually move into debate, we need to sort out exactly what the refusal reasons might be. Um, you want to do that, Helen? Yeah, I think, um, sorry, did you want to say? I think Tricia outlined a whole lot of different reasons that could potentially be grounds for refusal. But I'm, I'm very much holding in mind our experience with the Berryfields and Stonehouse where despite an officer recommendation for approval, DCC voted to refuse that planning application. The owner appealed and subsequently that appeal was upheld. And the grounds there for refusal were to do with the fact that it was open space, it was playing fields, it was recognized to be a value to the community. That recognition was embedded in some of the local documents and emerging plans. And I think we've got a very similar situation here We've also got highways concerns. We've got environmental issues as well. Um, but to me, my mind, it's those. Um, it's the, the fact it's an open space, which is recognised to be a value to the community. That is the overwhelming, overwhelming reason here. But please advise if you would like to use other reasons. Yeah, I will obviously pick that up very strongly from the debate. Um, I th think previously. Uh, landscape was a, was a major issue, landscape impact, and I, I think that's come up as well. Um, officers can't get too involved in, in pointing us towards precise policies, but I think ES13, um, Jeremy is, is suggesting is a pertinent one here. Um, just to guide us on specific policy. Yeah, so I was about to go from memory, but I've just been handed the uh, the uh, Stroud plan. I think ES13 is protection of 
for existing open space? So, Chair, we've got the, yeah, ES13, similarly on the same subject um, that Helen's mentioned, there's ES7 and HC1. Could I just so advise on with regard to, and I understand the concerns, but um, whilst I, I think um, there is certainly the ability to have a, a, a difference of opinion about the about the open space. Um, I am cautious about highways because we haven't received any highway objection to this proposal and obviously they are the technical experts. Um, and also similarly with, with environmental issues, again, I, 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 if we're talking about specific ecology on the site, again, our ecologist has looked at the proposal and has not found it lacking. So I, I, I think those areas are less straightforward from an officer point of view, but certainly there is merit with regard to the first main point, which I think has been carried through in, in, in some of the discussions. Yeah, I've, as I said, I've certainly picked up very strongly that, um, uh, that loss, of, loss of the public open space and also landscape impact, which um, if I can look for guidance from officers, and I was assuming ES7, um, would I be right in? Yeah. So ES13, as we've already mentioned, ES7 and, and HC1. Yeah. Um, and um, I'm assuming there's the, that the, the MPPF could also be could be brought in. MPPF 174 sounds familiar to me. We, on those, those the barriers, and then we can do the actual issues of reasons. The chair, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, sorry. Yeah, Martin, did you have a question? Well, another a suggestion for another basis for refusal. Um, CP fourteen, paragraph seven. No unacceptable adverse effect yes, on Nick, the amenities. Nick, if Nick, they just, Nick just raised that. Yeah. So that's yeah. what I was going to suggest. Was we're we we're, we're, we're getting there on the general areas um, and what we could do is we could um, uh, work on the assumption that um, if committee are okay with it eventually we, we when we take the vote that um, these are the areas that you would if you decided to refuse you'd refuse on and then the exact refusal reasons which would be pretty much these would be would be settled on by um, the, the officers with in, in consultation with me and the, and the vice chair to make sure that they reflect the, the views of the committee. So, um, so yeah, F CP14. Um, yeah. Um, do we? Well, and if we want to bring in something from the MPPF, we can do that later on. Yeah. Yes, Lorraine. I would be concerned, um, hopeful, that we don't leave out anything that can could be left out if it goes to appeal. Right, and that we would lose on. Um, for instance, there is there are other issues besides that. Don't ask me for the codes because I don't know what they are. That's you know what they are. Um, there's the lack of parking. There's the over. Uh, sorry, the loss of parking. The overlooking. Other other things besides the open space need looking at. Um, yeah, as I'm sure officers will say, it's. I think generally it's better to go in strategic tactically to go in with strong refusal reasons if we start putting in things that are a bit on the weak side there and they, they get knocked down at appeal then it starts to make the case look weaker it's good to have one two three really strong things that you know you can put up a good defense on so but if, if the committee is okay with that we've got the areas outlined we all, we're all uh, settled on what the areas are for a potential refusal and um vice chair and chair could Decide on the exact refusal reasons in, in consultation with, with officers, if if you if you vote for refusal. Okay, so we got those sorted out. We can go into debate. Um, anybody want to debate? Mark. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I, I'm very nervous about this, to be honest, because I think the community voice here is is very clear. Um, there's a long planning background to this, which is obviously not something that we can really go over today in terms of setting any precedence for development on the site. Uh, in my opinion, I think the, the various factors have been weighed up by the officer and 
I can't argue with the officer of opinion based on the matters that he will weigh up in the planning balance. Uh, my fear is that, as quite often is the case, the voice of the community doesn't really give us a strong enough reason for refusal. And if we are going for open space, um, the Berryfields situation was a fantastic uh, um, uh, expression of the community power and the ability of the committee to consider that and refuse it. But Berryfields is a different situation than this open space, I'm afraid. Berryfields was a playing field that was in uh, constant use. Um, here, unfortunately, we've got private land that has no playing field designation um, except for the, the fact it's called um, the playing field, uh, which uh, is confusing on its own. So I'm, nerv Sorry. I'm nervous uh, on um, go going with my heart, which would be to listen to the community voice and the, the loss of this green space. Um, but I, I fear we'll lose it at appeal. So I'm conscious of the taxpayer funds necessary to um, that would be lost in that appeal. And I don't feel strong, a strong, we have strong enough reasons to be able to support it. Although I do want to go with my heart. I do want to listen to the residents, which I feel should have a, a stronger voice. But unfortunately, the planning system doesn't provide that. So I'm, I'm nervous to go for a refusal myself. Thank you. Martin? Uh, I share Mark's nervousness about this. I'm not sure we have uh, very strong, in part because of the officer's recommendation, I'm not sure we have very strong grounds if it gets appealed, but, um, but uh, perhaps I'm going with my heart. I, I feel, a, apart from, in addition to the expression of community opinion, um, that's a piece of open green space that we haven't discussed the, the ecological merits and it may not be top tier environmental land, but it is a habitat and the, the in ecological appraisal referred to the inevitable loss of habitats, maybe not the best habitats around, but loss. Um, and having been there and looked at that piece of ground, it could be richer habitat. Um, so. Uh, I, I'm going to quell my anxiety about that, Mark. <laughs> uh, oh, sorry. Yes, Lorraine, then Lucas. Oh, okay. Okay, Lucas. So, oh, Victoria, did you have your hand up? Sure. So, Lucas and then Victoria. Okay. We're here in a planning control committee. We're in here in planning. We have to plan for the future. We have to plan for well-being. And I feel the well-being of the residents of Queen's Court are going to be adversely impacted by this development. A huge opportunity is lost to look at the whole. And actually, yes, maybe there should be some development in that. Maybe. But under the present uh, development, not the whole community is taken into account. And I think... This is an indictment of maybe the, 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 the approach that has been taken by this de developer. And I feel we are planning for the future, we're planning for well-being and well-being in the community. So I'm against this proposal on that, those grounds. Victoria. Thank you. Um, I was going to say, I'm actually not as nervous for this one as the DCC. We're here to appraise, view, listen to both sides and understand any material planning reasons. There are so many material planning reasons why this shouldn't be um, permitted. Um, not only the, the developer hasn't come to us in person, I understand there's a statement here, but um, it's, it doesn't feel like that that's really fair. Um, the MFFP guidance, the public concern and interest, which is clearly apparent here around us today, as well as local district councillor and parish of here, um, it's been refused previously. I know we're not allowed to look at it as a whole, but I think we should take that into account a little bit. The wider development that's going on in Brinscombe, I believe the um, uh, Camp Parish hated that they're going to double their homes, double the amount of homes coming. Um, but going back to the material raisins, the access is possibly an issue. I know we said that it might, we wouldn't, but that splay doesn't look right to me. 
um, the ES6 and the ES7. Um, it's narrow, the access safety, the develop, like delivery drivers, all that kind of stuff. Wildlife, the visual impact, destruction of trees. I think you, I don't, I'm not nervous about this being refused because there's so much there and that makes it even more um, plausible to be refused. It's not just one element that we're discussing. There's so many. Um, so yeah, I, I'm going to be refusing. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that, but I think we should. Okay, any, yes, Jenny. I'm on the nervous side. I'm not quite sure we've overcome the presumption in favour of developments. But I do understand the heart side too, and the biodiversity and the fact that locals use this, whether they've whether that counts or no, but they obviously have considered it their open space for a long time. So I think I'm going to abstain, if that's allowed in planning. Yeah, certainly. Um, any more debate? Yes, Lorraine? I'm not remotely anxious. Sorry. Um, I do believe the berry field was privately owned, was it not? Thank you. So if there's no comparison, you can't use that as an excuse. Um, I'm not really one for telling people what they can and can't do with their own piece of land. However, we have pretty much the whole community here. If we don't listen to them, earlier today, sorry, this evening, I was praising a developer for listening to the community. Here, we've got an absentee developer. Apparently, he hasn't turned up well, they haven't turned up because of where they live. Well, where do they live? I don't know where they live. Obviously, not close enough. <clears throat> I look at it as my job to listen to the community, be that to go along with the office advice or otherwise, right? I'm not frightened of going against the office advice and listening to the community. Done it before, we'll do it again, as you know. Um, and I think that's... It's not your job to do that. It's our job to do that. And if it all goes wrong, it's our fault, not yours. Any more debates? OK, um, so no more debate, then we can go to a vote. But, um, as discussed, um, you'll be voting on refusal uh, on the understanding that the exact refusal reasons will be decided on by officers in consultation with the chair and vice chair, and that we'll be sticking to the kind of refusal reasons that we've already outlined. I mean, I'd love to be going into the biodiversity and so on, but uh, there's nothing actually on that site that, as, as, the, as the husband of a principal um, ecologist, that couldn't couldn't be mitigated and. We just wouldn't win on that, unfortunately, in appeal as much as we should be. And having um, recruited ourselves a, a biodiversity uh, lead officer, hopefully we'll be doing a lot more for preservation and improvement of biodiversity in the district in the future. We should have had one a long time ago, but using that as a reason for refusal on something like this, we're just on, on, a, on a loser. But I, I would agree that I think we do have it is about planning balance, um, uh, and I, I think we do have some strong reasons to, to go for refusal if that's what you decide to vote for. So if everybody's okay with voting on that understanding, um, all those in favour of refusal. And that is clearly passed. So that is refused. Um, yeah. Yeah. Do you, want, do you want the actual number? No. Okay, yes, yes, sorry, we've had to do that. Um, but that would have been done on the electronic thing, but can I just have a show of hands again for those definitely for refusal? For refusal. Eight. Got, eight. got me? Okay, so eight for refusal. Abstentions? Two? Those against? None? Okay. All right. Um, I'm aware of the time. Although the clock actually says five past nine. It's actually only five past eight. But even so, we've been going for two hours now. 
I think I'm going to take a 10 minute break just while the room, cl room clears for the public who want to go home now. Um, and then
Okay, final application on the agenda for tonight. Final planning application, not the final agenda item. Um, land at the rear of One Cutler Road, Stroud, erection of bungalow with associated car parking, refuse recycling provisions, like electric wheelchair storage, amenity space, etc. Uh, case officer is uh, Gemma, Gemma Davis, who's going to um, introduce the report now. Good evening, members. Um, so the application before you this evening is for the erection of a bungalow. It's located within the defined settlement limits of Stroud um, up in Uplands. No, no, sorry. Um, so the bungalow is located on a dense housing estate um, that is predominantly characterised by two-storey terraced and semi-detached properties. Um, to the south of the site, there are some bungalows. Um, we've got an enclave of five, which is just here where my mouse is pointing. Can you see that? And then the bungalows go further beyond the two-storey houses here, down off, off, off the page. Um, here we've got the bungalow sat in the plot here. It's approximately seven metres forward of the building line that's formed from number one Cutler Road. So this distance from here is approximately seven metres. And this drawing is actually misleading as there is a new two-storey property that has been constructed here, a detached unit. Um, you can see it in the photograph just here. Um, and it is some um, 11 metres from the frontage of this property. Um, so in terms of the site and the surroundings, as I've said, it's characterised predominantly by housing, um, where the houses front the highway and benefit from long linear gardens to the rear. So local plan policy HC1 asks for housing to be of a scale, density, layout and design that, that is compatible with the area um, in terms of its character and appearance and the amenity. I have recommended refusal for this application on the basis that it does not comply with that policy as it is forward in the plot and therefore outside it's contrary to the policy and that it's incongruous and not in keeping with the existing pattern of development. That's one of the refusal reasons. Again, the site is quite constrained. Um, it was a former garden. It has been fenced off. Um, so we've got a fence along this boundary here, a wall along this boundary and a fence along this boundary. The proposed dwelling footprint is approximately 50 uh, cubic metres on a site of approximately 160 metres. The surrounding properties are in the region of 40, 45 metres squared um, footprint with gardens around 100 and 40, 150 metres squared. The garden space for this proposal here is obviously surrounding the unit, but in terms of the usable garden space, we've only got this space here, which is to the side of the plot. This measures approximately 40 square metres. The outlook from this door um, in the lounge area would be of a fence, um, which is just some four metres from the window. So again, um, policy HC1 uh, requests that there's an appropriate area of private amenis, amenity space provided for the occupiers of the dwelling. So yes, we have got amenity space, but it's not considered to be of a, an equality. It's also taken into consideration that number 53, which has been built out here, has front facing windows and it's, they are right on the boundary. They're at first floor level. So there's also the potential for overlooking into this <laughs> private amenity space. Um, so another refu refusal reason has been the fact that the amenity sp um, space provided is of low quality, which is insufficient. Um, again, we've looked at obviously that, so it's cramped and overdeveloped. Um, the layout of the area is incongruous. It doesn't follow the existing pattern of development. 
um, we're losing an area of open space, so to speak, infill in this area with built form, you would lose this relief of built form. Um, and the fact that the amenity area is insufficient. Um, in terms of the planning balance, whilst it would contribute to a housing need um, and to the size of, of the units in the area, um, this would not outweigh the harm of permitting a low quality designed unit. Happy to take any questions. Okay, thanks Gemma. Um, public speaking, um, Speaking, got Councillor Paula Baker, Board Councillor. Um, you don't have a time limit, Paula. I don't think I'll need one, to be honest. Um, my name is Paula Baker. I'm the Ward Member for Uplands, and I'm speaking in support of this application. Um, this obviously isn't a plot with any community value at all. Um, it has looked grotty for years. Um, and it's the type of area where people walk by and say, what, when are they going to do something about that? It really does bring down the overall aspect of Thompson Road at the top. Um, so it's overgrown. It's partially concreted, I think. Um, and it, it really is very, very grotty. Um, the development itself would certainly improve the outlook for residents in the area. Um, I know that the plot was previously part of a back garden of number one Cutler Road, but it was subsequently partitioned off and sold by the Stroud District Council in February 2020 to the applicants. The advert, uh, the auction advert, which I've read, actually states that the land was um, had potential for development on it. Um, but it, judging by what's just been said, it doesn't seem likely that that was considered at the time when they advertised it. Um, there is general support for this land uh, to be developed as bungalow suitable for someone with disabilities. And that's evidenced by the comments on the application and also from the local people that I've spoken to. I haven't heard from anyone who feels that this would be um, a poor decision. As you know, there is a shortage for accommodation suitable for disabled people across all tenures in Stroud. And this is exactly the type of pocket development that we need on a brownfield site to meet that need. Whilst the site is undoubtedly small, it would be suitable as a property for someone with disabilities who would be likely to struggle with the maintenance of a large um, amenity area. In my view, a bungalow would not be incompatible with the area, as just beyond the three properties adjacent to the site to the left, um, all the properties on the same side of the road on John Bevan Close are bungalows. The street line, which has been mentioned before, there are only three properties on Thompson Road on that portion of the road, which actually face the road. And those are the three properties to the left of the site. The other properties are on, on Cutler Road and on Folly Lane, and it's their gable ends which face the road. And incidentally, number two um, Cutler Road has extended um, so that the actual gable of the building now borders the pavement going along Thompson Road. I don't really see the building line at all because it it is presently so jagged. Um, so I don't feel that it would be incompatible with the site. Um, <laughs> additionally, as the proposed development is a small bungalow, it would have minimal impact on neighbouring homes as it wouldn't overlook other properties. And it would certainly smarten up the area and provide someone with a home. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thanks, Paula. Right. Um, anybody have questions for the officer? Yes, Lorraine. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Have we still got highways here? Yes, thank you. Um, may I first just say, while I have, while I have no problem with small residences, and we have a shortage of one bedrooms anyway, 
I do have a little concern about the parking and the access and egress. Is, is it correct that you must be able to access and egress in forward gear or not? Um, through you, Chair. Uh, that's on a classified road. And this wouldn't be a classified road. So there wouldn't be a problem with no. reversing no. out? No. Okay. That's, that was mainly really true. As far as the, there was a half a one. Um, the living room looking onto the fence. Uh, that, thank you. Um, the living room looking onto the fence. I don't know about the building up the whole thing, but just to me being a simple soul, I would have thought if that was really important, could it not be swapped around so that the living room is looking out that way and the bedroom's looking at the fence? Did you want me to come back on that one or yeah so we don't actually control the internal arrangement um so whilst, so whilst the it's identified at the moment that the living room would look out onto the fence and if they were to swap it around there would still be the fact that there's such close proximity to a hard edge looking out of a window which is isn't obviously of any quality so whether it's a living room or, or, or a bedroom Any more? Any more questions? No? Yes, Helen? Sorry, I'm sort of thinking about this as we speak. Um, I think I think what, I, what I'm wondering is that because the objections, Gemma, that came up are to do with some of them are sort of insurmountable because of the size of the plot. Is that that's correct? Yeah. So yes, it is a constrained plot for the size mm. of the unit. Mm. Mm. And yet we hear from the ward councillor who's telling us that this this plot is it's it in its current state is an eyesore, and the local community would like it developed in some way, and there is a need for small properties. So I think we've got a, a difficult balancing again here. Victoria. Also add to that tonight we discussed previously that the experts and highways are you know we should we should follow that and forgive me if I can't find it but there doesn't seem to be any objections to highways on this development either um, so it's really nice to see so many comments from the residents and public that are for a development we don't get that very often um, um, the wonderful world of DCC you would never know what you're going to get in here so it's um it's quite a pleasant surprise so just my computer's frozen and I'm really sorry. Why, what particular reason have we decided to refuse this development? Just because of the overdevelopment? Or, sorry. So there's four refusal reasons um, that's been put forward. So the fact that it would introduce development on a constrained plot that would dominate the space resulting in the site appearing cramped and overdeveloped and it being inconsistent with the layout of the street scene and the surrounding area. Um, therefore causing harm to the overall character and appearance. Um, the space in between the plots, so number one and number 53, so that area um, would be lost and there would be no relief, relief from built form. Again, due, due to the size and scale of the dwelling, coupled with number 53 Thompson Road, so the new build two-storey property, the amenity space would be of low quality because it wouldn't be private and it's also very small and we haven't had any mitigation measures with regards to the Rob Common SAC. Thank you. Yes, Jerry wants to just come in. Can I just on make a, a very brief comment? Uh, two things. The first of all is, is the comment about an untidy site. Um, it, you know, it, it's, it, we shouldn't be granting planning permission because the site is untidy. That is a method that people will use to devalue their sites and make it seem more attractive. So again, if you were looking to, to permit this application, then I would ask you to 
to do it on planning grounds, not on the, the state of the current site. The, the, the uh, planning legislation, if, if the site was, if it was very untidy uh, and a nuisance to residents, then there are other ways that we can try and tackle that with, a, with what's called a Section 215 notice. So again, I'd ask you to look at the planning merits and not so much the, 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 the state of the site at the moment, because that you know, is, not, is, 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 um, is, a, is a known ploy to make sites allegedly more attractive for development. The other, the other issue, um, members, is that if you were minded to permit this application, I would be grateful if, you, if we could ask for delegated authority to permit, because it is important that we get those payments for the special areas of conservation that have been mentioned and are currently a reason for refusal. But that is an important uh, tool for the member to protect our special conservation areas. So. Um, if you were minded to permit, I would request that it be delegated permit so that we can secure those payments before issuing a decision notice. Thank you. Uh, Helen and then Mark, and then, Luke, and then Lucas. Just, just I wanted to clarify, um, in, in your report, Gemma, it says that we've had 19 letters of support by the 26th of October. I just wondered if there's any further letters of support or any letters of, of objection as well now. Um, we haven't received any letters of objection um, and no further letters of support. Uh, yeah, Mark, then Lucas. Um, just, a, um, just a clarification. Um, I, was, um, I was very pleased to uh, hear the input from uh, Councillor Baker, but I was a little bit puzzled because, uh, and I just want to make sure the public record is correct, because I was expecting um, Councillor Baker be, to be uh, talking in terms of objecting uh, because the, the, the report states basically the refusal reasons put forward by the officer, not by the councillor. Um, could I just clarify that? That's on, the, uh, on page 59 of the agenda um, where it states the application has been called into DCC by Councillor Paula Baker. The planning reason for the call in request and then that states reasons for potential refusal. Yeah, that, that did cause a little bit of confusion initially. Um, we took it as being that uh, the ward councillor was objecting, but um, further discussions elicited the response from Councillor Baker that she was actually supporting. Um, it's just the way that the the planning reason was, was worded. It was a little bit confusing, but yeah, I mean, the ward councillor is supporting. Um, I've got, if you've, you've done Mark with quick, yeah, Luke, Lucas. There is no letter of objection from the neighbours. So the fact that the garden has maybe got a lack of privacy, it's that garden has got a lack of privacy, not the neighbours. And presumably if the occupant felt that they had a lack of privacy, they would do something about it by putting a fence up or whatever else so there's an approximate two meter high fence there at present um and it's not just the occupier that we would be protecting now as future occupiers as well yes well when we're granting permission we have to make sure that we're, we're granting permission for something that anybody who lives in it later on would would be able to enjoy the proper amenity space etc yes nigel um, yeah, you say that there were um, there weren't really any pre-application discussions, and you talk about low quality design. I'm just interested what sort of things might have been recommended in pre-application discussions. Had a pre-app been submitted on this site, it would have been advised that it's obviously a small site and a new dwelling wouldn't be appropriate. So an alternative development. Um, a garage block, maybe. So, to, to, just to be clear, you're, you're basically saying that another kind of dwelling, say a two-storey dwelling, that freed up more amenity space, wouldn't still wouldn't be acceptable there. It would need to be something. Or, sorry, uh, just asking Jenna to, to just to be absolutely clear that. You're basically saying, basically saying it's too small a plot for any dwelling. A two-storey dwelling that freed up more amenity space wouldn't still wouldn't solve the problems. It would need to be a garage block or something. 
So each application is dealt with on its own merits without having any detail in front of me. It is obviously dis difficult to make that assessment, um, but due to the size of the site um, and the building line that we've got, I would say that it probably would be difficult to try and achieve a, a unit on that site with the, the constraints. It's a real tight knit um, site. You've got obviously residential properties surrounding it, so I think it would be difficult to overcome those those constraints in terms of overlooking, etc. Yeah. I mean, obviously, it's not our job to try and say what should be going on there or could go on there, but it was, I think it's useful for members to be aware of that, you know, simply putting something different on there would still cause problems. Sorry, I lost track of who's asking questions. Martin, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Gemma. Um, when you you say it's not, not considered good design, and I think I think from your report that I see two things that, that uh, make that support that view. One about the not fitting the character of the, of the neighbourhood and the other the limited private outdoor amenity space. So is there anything about the the design of the bungalow in itself that you consider not good design or is it those, as it were, external? It is just those external bit. issues, yeah. yes. The the bungalow itself, I think, is of the correct proportions. It's, you know, materials that's in keeping with the area. So the actual physical appearance of the bungalow, I would say, is, is fine. It just doesn't fit in that location. Thank you. Any further questions? Yeah, Lorraine. Have we got a picture of the street scene, the wider location? That's the only pictures that I do have as part of the presentation. I could... Yeah, so in terms of this picture here, so the site, can, can you see this um, advertising board here? So this is the site literally there. Yeah. No, we, no, I haven't. Sorry. Any more questions? No. There's no more questions. Then um, anybody wish to propose officer advice, which is to refuse? Um, alternatively, does anybody wish to propose permission? Lucas, what, uh, which are you proposing? I'm okay, so you're proposing to permit uh, anybody? Yeah, there will be a delegated decision involving the chair and vice chair. Anybody wish to second that? Helen? Okay. Right, in that case, we can go into debate. Lucas, do you want to kick off since you're proposing? We live in extraordinary times. We've got a huge housing need. And whereas this is not necessarily an ideal development, it serves its purpose of having a created a disabled, uh, a dwelling for a disabled, potentially for a disabled person, uh, adding a smallish home. Um, yeah, and I'm all for smallish home. Um, yes, I've got some reservation about the fact that they haven't made it a passive house or something like that, that or put solar panels on it that hasn't been proposed yet, but I hope they come around to that. Um, I feel also with all the support there is in the neighborhood, including the town council, uh, who am I to stand in the way of that? And I would really like to see this developed uh, in, in a wholesome manner. Yes, Mark. Um, yeah, I, I, I completely understand the um, the reasons put forward, um, but looking at the looking at the site without the um, the plan on there, it does look like a development plot. Um, and whilst it's not sold with planning permission, we again have the situation we, where we have development potential as the background to this plot. So it wasn't part of the garden, as I understand it. It was it was a plot owned by the district council. Um, and I think the reasons, in this case, it, it would appear that the reasons for refusal are actually reasons to support in terms of an intended user, uh, whether they be elderly or, or disabled. It is a perfect property in the perfect place um, 
uh, within the community to be able to support such uh, a person. I know we can't condition um, uh, future residents or, or uses, I guess, in this case, but that is the likely user. Um, so as long as overlooking, overlooking was my main concern, it, as long as overlooking is um, not going to be an issue in this case, and the fact the neighbour hasn't put in an objection or a comment on this it, it, it is also saying something, then I'm, I'm more minded towards supporting. Yes, Lorraine. Thank you. Um, I think we're rather privileged living where we do. Um, most of us have gardens, quite large gardens, some not so large, mine's not so large. I don't have a view outside of my garden because of the way it's situated, but from my kitchen and upstairs bedroom, I can see down into my garden on my fish pond. Um, there are lots of places that don't have any gardens at all. They're lucky if they have a backyard or an amenity space to put their bin. My real issue was with the parking and the getting in and out. And as that has now been resolved by our highways representative, I don't really have an issue with it. Um, we do need single bedroom accommodation. We need single person accommodation or couple accommodation as well, because it could be a single person or a couple, one bedroom. We're really short of that. Um, and it's going to tuck itself away in between the houses. Where I live, we've got a mixture. In certain, certain estates where I live, there's a mixture. And they've all added on bits here and bits there because they can't afford to go and buy a bigger house. They've added a bit on. Um, I, look, I look at this as, you know, it has potential for somebody to live in, um, excluding the highways thing, which I'm still a bit touchy about. Um, I wouldn't like to be, especially if I was disabled, wouldn't really want to be reversing out of there. But that's resolved, so I would be more likely to support it. Any more debate? Yes. Jenny. I, I can understand what we're saying about the street scene because I live in a ward with lots of former council houses that have had houses put into their gardens and that seems to go through fine because it's a, it's a similar size house to the surrounding houses. But this is situated on what there is no street going along that street as it were there isn't front of houses so i'm less worried about that and i am more worried that i get a lot of phone calls from people needing homes that are suitable for people with mobility issues so i'm veering towards it except um accepting this um application Anybody else? Hmm. No, I can see this is this is a it's a difficult planning balance for the committee. I can, I can understand both sides of the argument. I'm very apprehensive about watering down our requirements for amenity space and what you see when you look out of your window and creating problematic housing for the future. Um, there's a hell of a lot of that going on on a much larger scale nationally. <laughs> Um, thanks to permitted development. Um, but on the other hand, I can see that there, there's a lot of sympathy for, on the other side of the argument, for providing housing. That I, I'm st I still worry a bit that somebody might be prepared to live in this as it is now, but somebody else might move in later on thinking it's okay and then find it's detrimental. So it is a fine balance. That was my Worth. Yes, Lorraine, did you want another go? Don't we take every case on its merits? Therefore, yes. it's an individual case. I'm just saying this is a, this and is can a... we put conditions on it regarding which way round it is? We wouldn't be able to put a personal um, condition on it because it, they would fail to meet the tests. I suppose there wouldn't be anything stopping a future resident or future residents changing the internal layout a bit. So I guess that, you know, 
just because a sitting room window faces a certain way doesn't mean people can't change the way they use the rooms. I do feel very split on this one. I do feel very concerned about watering down our approach to amenity space and what it's going to be like to live in that house in the future. But yes, Victoria. <laughs> Just, uh, we've already said this evening that we should um, that planning is subjective and it all is taken on its own merit. And um, how I got to this situation was that I was refused. Um, well, a planning permission was permitted, and it at the detriment of future past residents. Um, so I think you, just to remind the committee and everyone here that we should take this as it is. Um, it, it sounds like. Yes, it could technically be viewed as overcrowded, but as a single story and the, the no objections with from any residents saying that it's going to be affecting their privacy or anything like that. I think I have to lean towards going to to, to approval as well. Um, but, but yeah, just to remind everyone that we should take everything on our own merit as we see it, because we know that future development may happen and it's not going to go anywhere and that happens all over the place not only ones that come to DCC but thank you yes exactly we I mean yes we do take every application on its own merits and this approving this wouldn't necessarily prevent us taking a, a stricter view in the future um yes okay I've got um, Nigel and then Lindsay and then Lucas I'm not sure that's the order you put your hands up in but that's that's the order I saw them in. Uh, yeah, um, it, it says uh, that it doesn't complement or enhance the local context. But, um, you know, we all went on, most of us went on the site visit. And the site itself, it says, as it says here, is not inspiring in its character or design. I would argue that a bungalow there, it might not complement or enhance the local context, but it certainly won't make it any worse. Lindsay and Lucas. Thank you, Chair. I've wrestled a little bit with this one. Um, my initial thoughts were that um, it is overdeveloped. It's, it looks far too small. Um, but I'm, I'm kind of taking on, you know, what others have said. And obviously, a strong thing for me is, is the amount of support it has. Um, so I, I'm, I think I'm quite inclined to support this, if I'm honest. So, um, I have wrestled a little bit with it, um, cause I take on board what Gemma has said and obviously the planning policies, you know, I also take on board, you know, we do need houses. We do need, um, single occupancy or couple occupancy properties, um, and I, I really, I, I worried about the the new house that was next door, but I think with the layout, I, I can't really find anything wrong. So, yeah, I think I would be quite minded to support this. Thank you, Lucas. Yeah, I feel this is again one of these situations where one weighs things up, and. Um, I fully support Gemma and all the officers' efforts to really give us a brilliant and thriving and aesthetically also good environment to live in. Um, however, I live on a council estate and I go at least two plots where people have had planning permission to stick something in the corner with very little amenity space yeah, and a high fence around it. So, you know, you think, what immunity space is this? So I feel there is some precedent in our neighborhoods of this sort of thing having gone on. We shouldn't forget that. So we might potentially even get an appeal against this if we reject it. And because there are in, certainly in Stroud precedents for this sort of thing. So in, on putting those two things, you think, okay, um, I hope that with some planting also, you know, we always have the most positive image we try to have, you know, hopefully it won't be a, a dump for fridges and whatever else. Um, you know, also when whoever lives in there can't afford to get the, the council to take it away. Um, 
I also live in a property where I reverse in. Yeah, I drive just past it and then neatly reverse in and then I'll come out with my nose again. While you're on the road, you can reverse in. You can sort of take full sort of view of what's happening or wait for traffic to go by. So I think the that situation lends itself for something like that. And then the wheelchair comes out the back as well and is already near the thing. I'm just thinking of that just now. So I would, I'm minded to sort of say, okay, let this one go. Um, and it is just a shame. And one comment I would like to make is that if there had the comment I heard, and I don't know whether I got it right, or if they had a plea, they would have been rejected because we don't want a, a building there. Yeah, uh, uh, it would be out of proportion. So if the applicant knows that, he's saying, well, why should I bother? I got Then I've got a rejection. So let's go the other way. So I, I don't know whether we need to take sometimes a slightly different approach and, and say, okay, yes, it is potentially overdevelopment, but how could I work with you to that it actually would work? So question mark. I'm not a planning expert. and uh, But yeah, that's it for me. Yes, Mark. Uh, the thing that's ringing around my head is um, nobody's building bungalows anymore. And if we look at the if we look at the new development across the district uh, and the major allocations, such as Great Oldbury, which we looked at earlier, Hunts Grove, from where uh, where I'm from, thousands and thousands of houses. The, 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 you know, the vast majority of, of new development in this district. And nobody's building bungalows. And I often get calls from people who would dearly love a bungalow everything on one level accessible with a little uh, garden space but not too much to manage and i know we can't define that in this case but i think this one this is the exception to the rule and i, I don't want to go against our policies and i i can see exactly the, uh, the concerns of the officer but i think for me this is the exception to the rule because nobody's building bungalows anymore okay well, I'd just like to say as chair that I'm glad to hear the views expressed around the committee that, that we are very supportive of, of the officers, the, the principles around this of, of design and amenity space. They are important. And with some of the horror stories you hear about permitted development going on in, especially in cities these days, we don't want to be building horrible places or allowing people to build places that are horrible to live in. Um, so. Yeah, I think so. We're making it quite clear that this is not carte blanche for people to ignore um, amenity and design issues, and that in a different situation without so much community support, we almost certainly come to a very different conclusion. I do see a small elephant trotting around in the room in terms of selling land with development potential and labeling it when you sell it as having development potential, especially when it's. Uh, it's a local authority that's doing that. I would draw a small question mark around that issue. But it's not a planning matter, so that's not for us to worry about here. Um, OK, I think we can go straight to a vote. And I think I know how the vote's going to go. So uh, those in fa Oh, now, hang on a minute. Um, it was going to be delegated, wasn't it? Yes. Um, so, so I was going to say, so, so following on um, from that, so um, may I recommend delegated authority to permit the application with um, conditions uh, as required, and we can, we can supply those, but uh, delegated authority in order to secure that uh, those SAC payments. Thank you. Yes, it's important we make sure we get those SAC payments and, and the other any other conditions. So that would be delegated, the actual permission would be delegated to officers in consultation with the chair and vice chair. Everybody okay with that? Okay, so on that basis, those in favor of permission? And that's unanimous. Okay, so that's permitted. Um, we, so the members of the public want to go now, that's fine, unless you particularly want to listen to us talking about less interesting stuff, which we have to do now. Uh, yeah, we've got a couple of other agenda items. Shouldn't take too long. I'll just wait for people to leave first. <clears throat> Thanks, Gemma.
It wasn't too tactical of me, was it, to make those last comments? <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah. I know, I know. I wasn't, I wasn't, I was trying not to endorse that as best that I'm accepting. That's obviously swaying, swaying the committee. And, yeah. Mm. <clears throat> yeah. I don't, I'm not sure trainees are going to get around that. That's just the way they see it. So do the job. We're politicians. We're here to represent the community. The community yeah, behind us. Yeah, no, I was just, just trying to say, you know, I, I can see the way this is going. I can see why, why you're going this way. In a different situation, we might have a very different decision. Yeah. Mm. And there is definitely a question mark around whether the local authority should be selling. Some of this, I was going to actually say, some of the sites we've been to, where well, we were, you know, but, but, but we were selling off property services and selling off saying, you could build a house here. It turned up a size of come, really? Do you want to have a have, do you want to live in a house in one of these little hokey yeah. ex garage sites? Mm. I know it's not a planning matter, but <laughs> I think it's a moral question. Right. So obviously, are we going to, we're going to do six next time? Yeah. Five. Um, oh, it doesn't matter because Norman's not here now. Okay, so we've got two more items on the agenda. Item, uh, we'll take them in the order that we've got them here. So we got we, we did change them around because um, we were going to have another member coming to discuss one of the items. But planning enforcement is the first one on the paper that I have here anyway. Um, this is really... Um, well, you've all read the, the item, you're aware of what it is. Does anybody actually want to have any, have any, have any questions for officers to start with? Oh, does Griff, does Griff, oh, you actually want to, yeah, fine, Griff, Jim. Do you want me to have you sent the item? Yes, yes, I wasn't, I wasn't actually aware that you were going to actually introduce it, but fine, go on. Good evening, members. Um, this report before you presents the committee's uh, presents for the committee's approval the planning enforcement operational protocol which is attached as appendix a to your committee papers national guidance encourages local planning authorities to prepare and publish a local enforcement plan to proactively manage development manage planning enforcement in their local area a local enforcement plan should set out how the local planning authority will investigate alleged breaches of planning control and take planning enforcement action where appropriate. The council has a local planning, a local enforcement plan, the planning enforcement policy and procedure. The current plan needs to be replaced. There is ambiguity around its status with no record of how the plan was prepared or approved, and it is out of date, having been prepared most likely over 10 years ago. Work started on replacing the enforcement policy and procedure in the winter of 2020. Since then, the planning enforcement team has been subject to an audit, which reported to the Audit and Standards Committee on the 30th of November 2021. The audit confirmed the importance of replacing the local enforcement plan. The planning enforcement operational protocol before you this evening is proposed to replace the current policy and procedure in its entirety. One of the main themes that has emerged from the audit and feedback given to the service is that service users wanted improved communication and updates on the progress of planning enforcement complaints. The operational protocol has been specifically written to enable more regular and more meaningful communication with complainants and developers. As a change in style from the current plan, instead of explaining the galities of planning enforcement and the various planning enforcement mechanisms, the operational protocol provides detail on how officers will administer, evaluate, and progress planning enforcement complaints. 
Alongside the operational protocol, the service is also implementing IT improvements, which will allow better case management, more timely communication and improved decision making. Drafts of the planning enforcement operational protocol in various names were reviewed by officers prior to being presented to the Development Management Advisory Panel in May 2022. This was followed by a six week public consultation period over June and July. Town and Parish Councils and Stroud District Councillors were sent an email inviting them to comment. All comments were reviewed and the protocol amended prior to being discussed again by the Development Management Advisory Panel in October. A flow chart of the proposed process is contained in the operational protocol and I'm going to run through that for you now. I can change my screen, there we go. The most significant change is the introduction of a triage process. The aim is to speed up the initial assessment of enforcement complaints by establishing the basic facts of the case before an enforcement officer visits. The triage element will ask three questions. Has there been development? Is it permitted development? Is the development immune from enforcement action? Ooh, two computers, that's confusing me. Uh, planning enforcement may only intervene where there has been development. If the allegation does not involve development, the triage process will refer the customer to the relevant department or partner organization. Many developments can be undertaken as permitted development. Where we can establish that an alleged breach is permitted development, we will not continue the investigation. If we need further information or to visit the site, we will request this or go to the site as part of the triage process. Where development has become immune from enforcement action, we will try and identify this at the earliest opportunity. Following on from triage, where there's a breach has been identified or where a suspected breach has occurred, the operational protocol will require officers to undertake a harm assessment based on professional planning judgment. Where there is little or no harm, and it is likely that planning permission would have been granted should an application have been made, the enforcement officer will invite a retrospective planning application, pair a closure note for approval by a senior officer, the case will be closed and the complainant informed. Where there is moderate harm, officers will informally seek to remedy the breach or seek a planning application. If this is unsuccessful in the given period, an expediency assessment will be made. Guidance states that formal planning enforcement should only be taken when it is expedient to do so and in the public interest. The expediency report will recommend either the, that planning enforcement action is taken or no action is taken, and given the reasons for doing so. As this is theoretical at the moment, I thought I might run through a practical example. Not sure if you can see this, but those steps that we've uh, just gone through, where the lines across the top would go for the initial investigation, no breach would close it. If there's a breach, we'd do a harm assessment. Um, where we've got moderate and significant harm, we do an expediency assessment. But it's a bit theoretical. So if I give you an example, we might have an uh, enforcement referral about a shed that's been erected. In most cases, a shed will be permitted development, which will be coming down this route. During triage, officers will determine whether the shed is permitted development or not. When planning permission is required, the case will be referred to an enforcement officer. So that would be that we doesn't exceed, it exceeds permitted development. So we've gone down the suspected breach, we've done a, a investigation under the permitted development bit here and identified that it's a breach. Assuming planning permission is required, an enforcement officer will visit and appraise the development site and its context. This will form a harm assessment. A review of the planning history of the site may reveal that a previous permission has been granted for a similar structure in the, the location. In that instance, we'd have a breach of, develop, of planning control, but there would be no harm. And then we'd go down the breach route, a harm assessment, no harm, and prepare a closure note. If we take the same example a bit further, the shed may in fact be more like a garage, and the garage may be visible in the street scene, but it would not have a wider impact on the planning application. This would be a little harm and again would prepare a closure note. If that garage had been converted to an annex containing, say, a bedroom, shower room, small seating area used by a dependent relative, 
the conversion may not provide sufficient off-street parking to comply with the local plan. This would require a more detailed response. Enforcement officers may negotiate the provision of additional parking to rectify that harm, but in such circumstances, an expediency report would be prepared outlining what actions had been taken and why formal action was inexpedient to pursue. Finally, if we take this example all the way through, the annex had been refitted and now includes a full kitchen and bathroom and can then be used as an independently from the rest of the site. If the site falls in the open countryside where a new dwelling would not be permitted, an expediency report would be prepared setting out why the development conflicted with the local plan, recommending formal action be taken to remedy the breach. So that was a sort of a little example how we might end up down these different shoots of where our decisions are. Where you see the grey stars, that is points where we will inform the customer. And when you see the purple star, that is when we will have a continuous update of every 30 days to so that the complainants are, are kept informed. The operational protocol provides all involved in a planning enforcement investigation with a framework for both decision making and communication. National guidance encourages all local planning authorities to prepare and publish a local enforcement plan. The recommendation to this committee is that a planning enforcement operational protocol is approved for implementation from the 1st of January 2023, that an update on the implementation of the plan is provided annually, and that the plan itself is reviewed in 12 months. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Griff. Yeah, I should have been expecting you to introduce your report, just not used to having items on the agenda that aren't actual uh, planning applications, but becoming a planning committee at last. Um, right, that takes me back to the late 80s when we had a full planning committee and a subcommittee dealing with planning applications. Ooh, nostalgia. Right, does anybody have any questions, Mark? Um, I might be considered a nuisance to uh, planning enforcement officers, but I'm gonna say it anyway. Um, have we got the resource to be able to keep to the metrics within this plan? Um, I, I, I like what I see in terms of communication and feedback, because I, in my experience, um, that is a definite area of improvement. But I do know that um, enforcement has been down a number of staff over a long period of time. I know we've got new staff joined, but are, are we resourced to be able to meet the commitments contained within this plan from January? Um, and then I've got a follow on question, but I'll, I'll let you cover that first, please. Yes, thank you. Oh, sorry. Yes, thank you. Um, you hopefully will recall the audit report, which went to audit standards back in November last year. There are a number of things that we've committed to doing in the service. So the first thing is to bring forward our new operational protocol, which sets out what we think we can achieve. And we think that this is broadly achievable. However, as I said in my introduction, we are combining that with some IT improvements, which we don't currently have. So we are going to have to test it out. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna can't sit here and say, yes, we've done everything because it is part of a process. Um, we are aiming to switch on um, our penultimate bits of our IT improvements before Christmas and our final bits in the new year. Once that's done, we've committed to time and task monitoring so we can actually see exactly how long uh, an average enforcement complaint takes from when we receive it to when we close it. Um, and when we've done that, we've committed to a resourcing review of the team. Um, so the resourcing review will then either highlight that we do need additional resources in the team, and then that would be a matter for, for budget setting and members to either commit to that additional resourcing or it would identify that we have sufficient resourcing. So at the moment, we think it's broadly achievable, but we will wait and see and report back on that as we uh, carry out the implementation. Thank you, Griff. Uh, does that mean that we can assume that there will be that this should be considered a phased introduction from January with, with uh, reviews and updates and, and feedback? Because obviously it's, some of those things might take some time, especially resourcing, rather than setting expectations that we've got this you know, fantastic new procedure um, and over-promising. Um, do I, yeah, the question is, do we, should we consider it a phased implementation from January? Uh, I don't think we should consider it phased in the way we deal with new complaints from January. So complaints received from January will follow this flow chart and 
Um, as I said, we, we're fairly sure that we can stick to that. The issue that we'll have is whether that leaves any time for us to deal with our backlog. We do still have a bit of a backlog in the service and you're aware of some of the staffing issues that we've had. Um, if we find that that uh, is a, a problem, then we will look to resource that in ways that we can. Um, so I don't think it's phased because I think new things coming in will, will follow this process. There may be an impact on some of the stuff that's sort of clogged in the system slightly. I have a feeling I might be clogged in the system somewhere. Um, just in terms of categories, um, and this is my final question, just in terms of categories of uh, enforcement, uh, just from my own ward, um, I've got examples that fit this sort of criteria. So that's development that has uh, proceeded without permission, uh, and that would quite clearly fall into this flow chart. Uh, what about um, conditions that the planning authority has put on developers that are not being complied with? Would that fall into this flow chart as well, or is that a different category of enforcement? Uh, yes, um, enforcement will cover uh, where conditions that aren't going to be complied with, so that would fall into a breach. Um, in the protocol, we set out what uh, what a breach may be. Um, I think actually we might have paraphrased it. We might have paraphrased it in things you can complain about. So we are trying to watch our language because we know that planning can be pretty difficult to interrogate sometimes. Um, so section four of the protocol sets out what you can complain about and they will fall into this. So a non-compliance with a condition or um, uh, well, yeah. non-compliance with the condition would be a breach of planning control and it will then go through this process. So that would fall into the suspected breach category and would then look for evidence that that condition has been breached. And then it would flow through the same sort of process for the amount of harm that's causing and the expediency of taking action. Um, and it may well end up with a breach of condition notice. So yes, it would fall into this process. Uh, thank you, Griff. I'm, I'm very pleased to see this. So um, thank you for that. Uh, questions? No. Did I have any other? Bit, any other? Martin, other than yeah. you? No? Thank you, okay. Martin. Thank you, Griff. Um, this is this may be a repetition of part of Mark's question, actually. Um, so the cases I have some in my ward. Everyone has them, I think, that have been people have been banging on about for months, years, they, those cases at whatever stage they've got to so far will get brought into this stream, will they? Is that the plan? When we switch on our IT improvements, we will have to put a date range on it. So there will be some things that get pulled into that IT system. Um, we will have to work on making sure that we don't lose some of the other uh, cases that are going through. Something that our colleagues in the Fit for the Future team have been working on recently is a whole new suite of performance reporting tools. And um, they focus on development management to begin with because they're sort of testing it out and that's much easier for them to apply the rules to get us the data. So we are looking to bring in these reports that we can apply to planning enforcement investigations so that we can make sure that we're following through older cases much better um, and, and taking them through to completion. Uh, Tara, our senior enforcement officer, is, is here tonight to listen to the debate. Something that Tara and I are very aware of is how we manage our backlog. Um, we do still currently have a, a consultant enforcement officer with us. Um, we have extended their contract slightly and we've given them a chunk of backlog. Um, we will review how successful that is as an approach. Um, we have also started being a bit more proactive in some of our case management. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm not going to have any water because I saw what happened to Nick earlier um, in our supervisions. So we are now making sure that we can pick up on those sort of older cases. Uh, one of the things we've introduced is a sort of last touched date. So you can report on those cases that have been touched the longest ago. So it's probably a case of starting uh, at some of the oldest things and having a clear out and getting ourselves back up. Um, this will all come out in the resourcing review, seeing how much we've got left over and how much we need to invest in making sure that we meet this or an alternative if the, the resourcing isn't there for this protocol. Yes, Lorraine. Is this responsible for how quickly my recent one was dealt with? 
In, in part, yes. Whilst the papers here say we will introduce it from the 1st of January 2023, in reality, we have started drip feeding it into the service. Um, we've started the triage process. Um, so yes, in part. Okay, any more questions? If not, does anybody want to um, propose accepting this report? Uh, everybody. Uh, I'll take Lorraine, seconded, Mark. Yeah, okay. Um, anybody wish to debate? Yes, Lindsay. Thank you, Chair. Um, as somebody who is, this is um, my first Development Control Committee meeting tonight, I'm actually really glad to see that it's a report that is in plain English and very simple to understand. Um, obviously, with planning, it can be very complex. Um, so this, um, it really does set out everything that I think you need to know. Um, I too, I think, have already kind of been part of this with um, something that I reported a little while ago. Um, so I actually think it's great work. So thank you. Any other debate? No? Okay. Yes, Victoria. No debate, just to second what Lindsay just said. The report is in plain English. It is vulnerable. It is um, a really well thought out piece of work. So um, yeah, well done, Griff and team. Yeah, I shall pass that on to all involved. Thank you. Lorraine? Is this going to the Town and Parish Councils? Um, we have consulted the Town and Parish Councils on this. We sent it out to them by email shot in um, the end of June. It was on the public website. It was also in the e-news. So Town and Parish Councils have been consulted on that. And there is a summary of the consultation responses in Appendix C, should you wish to peruse them. We shall be putting it on the website from January. Okay. Um, yeah, it's a really good report and thanks for the work you put into it, Griff. Um, are we ready for a vote then? So you're voting to, you're resolving to approve the planning enforcement operations protocol for implementation from 1st of January to receive an annual update on the implementation of the plan and that the plan will be reviewed in 12 months. Okay, yes. All those in favour? That's unanimous. And again, thanks, Griff. Right, the last item is really just to note, unless anybody has any questions, uh, planning and enforcement, KPI statistics. Uh, did you want to say anything, Jerry? Uh, Chair, just to say, yes, it is just a report for information. We, we provide you with these figures every six months. Um, but to, to follow on from a point that Griff's made, we are looking to get a, a better suite of performance indicators. And so I'm hoping moving forward that um, we'll be able to present these in, this information to you in a more sophisticated manner. It's quite basic at the moment it gives you what you want but it, it would be nice to be able to provide it in a more visual visual sense possibly but um yeah happy to take any if you've got any queries either tonight or as a result of maybe in the future but we're more than happy to, just to answer any questions that you have okay so sorry are we actually just noting this yeah that's all um i suppose we still have to vote on it all those in favor of noting this Duly noted. Right. Okay. I think that's everything, isn't it? Thanks for coming. Safe travels home. <laughs>